So colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, if we could uh, get going here. Um, I apologize for the few minutes delay. We had some issues with the, the mics, which obviously are now uh, working. So welcome to the uh, June meeting of the Toronto Police Services Board. I call the meeting uh, to uh, order. And I think particularly on this National Indigenous uh, People's Day, uh, the Toronto Police Services Board uh, wants to acknowledge that the board is meeting on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, uh, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron uh, Wyandat, uh, and the home of many diverse Indigenous peoples. I'd like to move on, colleagues, to uh, a declaration of conflict of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and I would say that. Uh, I believe I have one with item number 11, and if it is uh, uh, held for debate, I will recuse myself and turn the chair over to uh, Vice Chair Hart. Uh, any other conflicts? Um, it's not a conflict, but just wanted to acknowledge that my colleague from the Canadian Mental Health Association is on the deputation list today. Councillor Hart. Chair, item number nine, special constables for TCHC, as my spouse is an employee of TCHC. Okay, thank you. Um, hearing none other, I'll move on to the confirmation of uh, the minutes of uh, May uh, 17, uh, 2018, and uh, motion to accept. Uh, Councillor Hart, uh, seconded Mr. Andrew Casera. All in favor? Any contrary? Okay, I'd like to turn now just uh, to items not on the agenda because this is a very special meeting for uh, uh, two particular people that have made huge contributions. First of all, and he's not uh, here, but Carl Druckmann, who has been the longtime lawyer, in fact, he joined the uh, uh, Municipality of Metro Toronto and the legal side in August of uh, uh, 1990. And he was for many years involved in supporting Albert Cohen as the uh, counsel to the board uh, from the city. But Carl has played an invaluable role for the board in giving us wise counsel and advice. And he will be retiring in a couple of weeks. And so uh, this would have been, is, this is the last uh, meeting before he does retire. And so I just want to acknowledge on the record uh, the significant and huge contribution and wise counsel that he's provided us over many years. The other, however, is uh, a really huge um, a change for the Toronto Police Service, and that is, uh, as many of you know, uh, Joanne Campbell, uh, who is the longtime uh, executive director of the Toronto Police Services Board, is retiring um, in a couple of weeks, and so this will also be Joanne's uh, final meeting. Joanne is retiring on July the 13th after uh, 30 years with the board, 25 of which she has been the executive director. And uh, Joanne, uh, I think as everybody knows, is really, I think in many ways, synonymous with the civilian oversight and governance uh, of the Toronto Police Services Board and the excellence to which uh, I think it's maintained a very high standard. And people know, um, and certainly I can say as the chair and as a, a board member for seven years, uh, what an enormous contribution Joanne has made, uh, not only in the obvious things about running this organization and her staff so efficiently, effectively, and smoothly, responding to all, seamlessly seemingly responding to all the multiplicity of demands uh, of the job, both from the board members, from the service, and, and, and from staff. Uh, Joanne's made this a robust and high-functioning team, and I say that having come from you know, a multitude of uh, for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. Uh, Joanne, you are an, uh, best in class in every way, and I cannot tell you the number of times, and you really see it as chair, the number of times your experience, your outstanding judgment has kind of grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and pulled me back from disasters or, or potential mistakes. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the institutional knowledge you have, uh, the wise counsel, uh, the experience, the respect with which you're held by all of your colleagues uh, at the city, here, throughout the police, 
And uh, at the meeting upstairs, Chief Saunders made a special presentation and a recognition on behalf of the service. But, uh, you know, I can't state how highly, and I see it out in the community when, when we go off to the Ontario Associations of Chiefs of, of, of or uh, Police Services Boards, et cetera, how highly your colleagues hold you in regard. It not only is Toronto the largest of the services, but it obviously runs so well and people look to you for that guidance and advice. But my experience is the enormous, you know, the, all the knowledge, all the ability, all the, the connections, all the experience, are second to really a, just an outstanding judgment that you bring to this a common sense and a real sense of what's right was fair and, and how we should proceed have made this, uh, and I know, I, I'm sure I speak for the, my past uh, chairs as well, uh, that you have made this uh, organization as good as it is in so many ways. And so, uh, you know, you are going to be missed enormously, but you have built a strong, outstanding uh, uh, organization. Uh, and we want to wish you every success in your next venture. And we have, I think, uh, something we want to present. Is that correct so, at this stage? So, Joanne, if you want to come up. Yes, um, uh, so um, Joanne, let me just say that uh, in every regard, I, I think, uh, as I said, is best in class. Uh, you set a very high standard. As uh, everybody knows, your successor who is sitting uh, to your right is Ryan Teschner, uh, who is the new uh, executive uh, director of the board, or will be in uh, July the 14th. Uh, I think many of you already know Ryan, who was the, uh, the counsel to Justice Morden in the G20 review, uh, his work with the province, uh, and he has a comprehensive understanding of policing, police governance, police oversight, and, and the challenges that we face. He was instrumental uh, with the recently proclaimed Safe Ontario Act of 2017, and I think we're re we had a very robust list of candidates who wanted to uh, succeed you, Joanne, and uh, Ryan, we're delighted that you uh, put your name forward and were chosen. And as I said, uh, uh, you have uh, very important shoes to fill, and uh, uh, we uh, look forward to working with you. Mayor Tory? I would just like to say uh, mostly that th we will be uh, recognizing uh, Joanne's contribution in front of the City Council, so I won't. Uh, repeat here what I will say there, but it largely would have been to repeat and to emphasize uh, the points made by the chair. I think I, for, I, first, I know I first met Joanne uh, many years ago at, at the Ontario level because I think maybe I was in provincial public life at the time. I don't even know why I was at one of those board meetings, and I was struck by the fact back then that she was, uh, you know, held in the highest regard by all of those people. And then I had my own chance to see why when I came uh, to this board and. Uh, so I just want to say, uh, you know, really echo what, what the chair said and to say we will have a chance to, uh, to honor you in front of the uh, city council. I can't say we'll give you a new car or anything like that there, but we will, <laughs> we will honor you uh, as well. And to say to Ryan, welcome, uh, you have an outstanding resume and that gives you a fighting chance of filling the shoes left by your <laughs> predecessor. But Joanne, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> How can you say no to that? <laughs> oh, okay, I'm overruled by the mayor. From the from there. Thank you, Brenda. We will all miss her greatly. So, Ryan, you're on notice. <laughs> uh, colleagues, let's quickly go through. There's a number of presentations and things, but let's quickly go through. And then I'm going to play fast and loose a little bit with the agenda because 
uh, of uh, item number five, but we'll come to that. So we've gone through uh, one through three. Item number four is a hold for um, a deputation. Uh, item number five is a hold uh, for a deputation. Uh, item number six is um, the recommendation for payment of legal indemnification um, uh, for case number 2130-17, uh, so a motion to approve. Uh, Councillor Hart, seconded by Mr. Jeffers. All in favor, any contrary? Thank you. Item number seven is a hold for deputations. Item number eight um, is a new job description, uh, psychological uh, assistant wellness, motion to approve. Councillor Hart, seconded by Mr. Jeffers. All in favor, any contrary? Item number nine is special constables um, uh, appointments, uh, the Toronto Community Housing Corporation, motion to approve. Mayor Tory, and Ms. Chandra Casera, all in favor, any contrary, thank you. Item number uh, 10 is um, uh, the uh, uh, reference check uh, program, the establishment of criminal record and justice matters, uh, checks procedures, uh, the proposed fee, a motion to approve. You hold, Ms. Senator Casera. Uh, number eight, um, I, as I say, will recruit myself on, but uh, the um, architectural services, item number 11, sorry, the architectural services pre-qualification vendors, motion to approve. Councillor Hart. Uh, yeah. In order to be for you to okay. be totally. Uh, uh, Councillor Hart. Yeah, just for uh, one second. We'll change the chair. All in favor? Okay, uh, item number 12 is a uh, uh, hold for deputation. Uh, item number 13, the same thing. Item number 14 is the uh, Central Joint Health and Safety Committee meeting minutes, motion to receive. Uh, can, uh, uh, Mr. Jeffers, uh, seconded Mayor Tory. All in favor? Any contrary? Uh, item number 15, there is a deposition. Uh, uh, let's go over the page here. Um, item number 16 is. Um, sorry, what's this? Is this. Uh, on 16, okay. So item number 16, there's a deputation we'll hold. Item number 17, the same thing. Item number 18 is the uh, Toronto Police Services Results 2018 follow-up of previous audit recommendations. A motion to receive. Councillor Hart, Ms. Chandra Casera, all in favor? Any contrary? Carried unanimously. Item number 19 is the Toronto City Council uh, expanded gaming at Woodbine Racetrack. Uh, uh, motion to receive. Uh, Mr. Jeffers, uh, sorry, it's to approve, not to receive. Uh, Mr. Jeffers, uh, Mayor Tory, all in favor? Any contrary? Uh, motion 20 is uh, <coughs> the Chief's Administrative Investigation to Vehicle Injuries uh, um, of uh, 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 Amanda uh, Argentino, Jennifer Brown, uh, Austin Dell, Daniel Powell, and Jamie Last. Uh, motion to receive. Uh, Mayor Tory, Councillor Hart, all in favor? Any contrary? Uh, carried unanimously. The next one, 21, the Chief's Administrative Investigation into the custody death of uh, Mr. Richard Brifo. Uh, motion to receive. Uh, Councillor Hart, uh, seconded. Mr. Jeffers, all in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Item number 22, the Chief's Administrative Investigation of the death of Mr. Uh, Blair Swenick. Uh, motion to receive. Uh, Mr. Jeffers, uh, Councillor Hart, all in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Item number 23, uh, the Chief's Administration, uh, Administrative Investigation of the death of Alexander uh, Boucher, motion to receive. 
Ms. Shanda Casera, uh, Mr. Jeffers, all in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Uh, there are quite a number of these, as you know, because we are doing a catch-up from um, uh, a backlog. So the next four or five are all uh, the Chiefs, the number 24, uh, Chiefs Administrative Investigation, Vehicle injuries, injuries to Mr. Shamar Morrison, motion to receive. Uh, Ms. Shanda Casera, uh, Councillor Hart, all in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Item number 25 is the Chief's Administrative Investigation for Firearms Industry in, in, Injury into uh, to Mr. John Doe. Uh, motion to receive. Uh, Mr. Jeffers, um, Ms. Sandra Gazzara, all in favor? Any contrary? Thank you. 26, the Chief's Administrative Investigation into the custody death of Mr. Dean Ferriero. Uh, motion to receive. Councillor Hart, Ms. Ms. Sandra Casera, all in favor? Thank you, carried. Uh, item number 27, uh, the Chief's Administrative Investigation of the Custody Injury to Mr. Jeffrey Rodaro. Uh, motion to receive. Mr. Jeffers and Councillor Hart, all in favor? Uh, carried, thank you. Uh, 28. The Chief's Administrative Investigation of the Custody Injuries into uh, Mr. Muhammad, uh, sorry, Abdul Muhammad. Uh, motion to receive. Uh, Ms. Sandra Casera, uh, Mr. Jeffers, all in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Thank you. Item number 29, the Chief's Administrative Investigation into Injury uh, Mr. David Toner. Motion to receive. Uh, Mr. Jeffers, Councillor Hart. All in favor, any contrary? And finally, there's a deputation on item number 30. Um, Chief, I hope this is getting us caught up on the administrative reviews. Um, it is, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, item number five, we, normally I would do item number four, which is uh, the important discussion on the missing persons uh, the investigation review working committee, um, but uh, given the special circumstances to item number five, uh, I would uh, ask that that uh, uh, be considered first. And there is a deputation by uh, by uh, uh, the complainant, Mrs. Celine Q. Um, and if I would, is uh, Mrs. Celine Q here? Okay, if not, um, then uh, there is no deputation. Um, I would just say that uh, this was, uh, uh, and you can see from the, uh, the thing that uh, uh, this was a, a bit of a confusing case uh, and uh, this individual wanted to come forward and, and uh, uh, make a further um, uh, deposition, but I, I think the board, uh, 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 my motion would be that the board, having discussed this, concurs with the decision of the chief that no further action is required with respect to this complaint. Uh, Ms. Celine Q's uh, complaint was about the retention of her fingerprints, and the chief has confirmed that the fingerprints have been destroyed. However, to ensure that uh, Ms. Celine Q understands uh, how her complaint has been addressed and the fact that her fingerprints are no longer in the Toronto Police Service's possession, the board would ask the chief to find an appropriate mechanism to effectively communicate this information to Ms. Celine Q, including exploring uh, facilitated and translated discussions uh, with community partners, family members, and others. And that, uh, I think, would assure her completely. So uh, that's uh, the motion I would put, uh, the, or I put on the table. Is there a proposer and uh, Second, Chief, have you got any comments on that? Are you fine with that? Yes, I'm, I'm good with that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, may I have a proposer then? Uh, Councillor Hart, seconded uh, Ms. Shandra Casera. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, thank you. Carried unanimously. That brings us to item number uh, four, which is the missing persons investigation. Uh, you'll know the background to this that we have. Um, uh, put forward a report uh, forming the, the working committee um, uh, to uh, review this and come forward with the terms of reference uh, at this meeting in June. I would uh, first like to thank the committee members uh, uh, 
who accepted this challenge and who I know have met seven times and had innumerable discussions uh, and come forward and, and uh, uh, particularly the facilitator, Breeze Davis, who has done uh, just yeoman service in, in doing this. So uh, everyone knows the background to it, uh, the, the, the Breeze. I would ask you to come forward and uh, thank you uh, very much and to present your section of the report. Uh, I'm a member of the working group and a board member with uh, the Alliance for South Asian AIDS Prevention. I'm just going to outline the presentation that Brees and I will do today. First, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge uh, Monica Forrester and Sarah Mainville, who are also members of this working group, and of course, Ken Jeffers, who is a member as well. Uh, Brees is going to begin by talking through the process of the working group, some of the considerations that we balanced in designing the terms of reference and the budget. And I'm then going to go on to speak about some of the specific community concerns that the terms of reference are responsive to. So I'll hand it over to Brees. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as you mentioned, the working group, well, as you all know, the working group was convened in the end of April and we got to work fairly quickly. We met seven times over the course of four weeks formally. There's been a lot of discussion uh, since then. Uh, the first question the working group had to ask itself and work on was what sort of review they would recommend. And they considered sort of a variety of options. There were four that were on the table in particular. One was uh, a, a public inquiry. Second was to ask the OIPRD to conduct a review. The third was to have the, this board commission an independent review. Uh, we also considered inquiries, uh, an inquiry by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Uh, to help answer that question, the working group had uh, consulted with some people who had been involved in past uh, police inquiries or reviews. So in particular, they met with Mark Saunders, who is external counsel to the OIPRD. Uh, they also met with Ryan Teschner in his capacity as formal can former counsel to the uh, to F Justice Borden's review. Um, we also got correspondence from the Ontario Human Rights Commission. And so with all of that, uh, the working group um, made a decision, as you know, from the report that we put forward to recommend an independent, um, an independent review commissioned by the board. I can say that the first choice would have been uh, to have a public inquiry, but the mandate of the working group group was very clear uh, that whatever recommendation they came up with would not include any information or discussion of the MacArthur investigation and possible criminal proceedings. And so uh, the working group came to the conclusion that a public inquiry wouldn't be appropriate at this point in time and so is recommending that you uh, commission a independent uh, review. Um, and we, they made that recommendation really for three reasons, um, having weighed the merits of all the different options that were on the table. And the three reasons are, one, to allow this board to determine the specific terms of reference. If it had gone, for example, to the OIPRD, well, this board could uh, uh, sort of encourage certain issues to be looked at, it, the terms of reference would have been determined by the OIPRD. It also allows this board to determine who the reviewer will be. Um, and then the third is that it allows this board to have some level of control over the manner in which the review is conducted. And in particular, that gives this board the opportunity to ensure that there's ongoing community involvement in the process. And you'll see from the terms of reference that we're recommending um, certain um, steps be taken by the reviewer to ensure that the community's input uh, is part of the process all the way through. So having made that decision, the working group then turned its mind to drafting draft terms of reference for your consideration. Um, I can tell you that the draft terms of reference were shared with Chief Saunders uh, through Staff Super Superintendent Demke, who was uh, appointed to assist the working group through our process. They were also shared with the Ministry of the Attorney General, and we got input and feedback that was considered by the working group. Um, most of the deliberations and certainly the aspect that I'm going to focus on was sort of the balancing uh, that needed to be done in light of the mandate that was given to the working group. So the working group was very committed to ensuring that the concerns that had been expressed by the communities 
were incorporated into the terms of reference, but we also wanted to make sure um, that any ongoing police investigation or ongoing criminal prosecution was protected so that the integrity of both investigations and prosecutions was protected through this process. And so we spent a lot of time drafting the terms of reference with those things in mind to make sure that the missing persons investigations, including those missing persons who have s subsequently been identified as alleged victims of Bruce MacArthur, to the extent that they can be looked at, will be looked at without prejudicing the uh, investigations or ongoing prosecutions. So we've put together terms of reference with sort of a number of features that, that we think strike that balance properly and most importantly protect the integrity of investigations and prosecutions going forward. So there's four aspects of the terms of reference. I'm not going to go through them specifically. They're all on pages 13 and 14 of our report, but I'm just going to highlight what they are for you so that, um, so that you can understand our thought process. So first of all, in the terms of reference, there's a clear direction to the reviewer uh, that the review will be conducted in a, in a way that will not prejudice any ongoing criminal investigation or ongoing criminal pr prosecution. That's an overall direction to the reviewer. It names MacArthur specifically. It also names Mr. Schlater specifically, who is the accused in respect of the death of Tess Ritchie. And again, it's a general direction to the reviewer that they conduct this review in a way that will not prejudice those prosecutions or any ongoing investigation or prosecution. There's an additional term that relates specifically to Bruce MacArthur. Um, and you'll, it's a bit, the language is, is very specific and the language is designed to make it clear to everybody what is going to be off limits in respect of Bruce MacArthur. And so what we have done is we have taken the date that the service has publicly stated was the date on which Bruce MacArthur became a suspect in this case, which was September the 1st of 2017, and we've made it clear that nothing from that point forward can be reviewed by the reviewer in respect of Bruce MacArthur. We have also made it clear that anything before September 1st, 2017 that relates to Bruce MacArthur in terms of contact he had with the service or whether he was a person of interest um, will be off limits as well for the reviewer. And um, we anticipate that the reviewer will consult with the service clearly uh, and robustly to ensure that uh, they understand uh, the contours of that term of reference. There's also a requirement in the terms of reference that the reviewer consult with the Ministry of the Attorney General and in particular the Director of Crown Prosecu Crown um, the Director of Toronto Region um, to ensure that uh, the reviewer gets as much information as they need in order to ensure that they're not prejudicing any ongoing criminal prosecution. And finally, there's a requirement in the terms of reference that nothing that the reviewer will publicly report uh, can prejudice any ongoing investigation or prosecution. And again, that's to ensure that in any public consultation or any public reporting that that is kept in mind uh, in terms of, of making information public. So the working group feels strongly that they have balanced the interests of the communities in getting answers to questions that can be answered now and pres preserving the integrity of the investigations and, and prosecutions. We're obviously uh, happy to take questions about that aspect. The last thing I want to talk about very briefly before Shakir talks about some of the terms of reference in particular is the budget. Um, so we have put forward for your consideration a, a proposal for budget and I think the one message that I want to give to you is it it's a bit of an arbitrary exercise at this point in time to come up with an accurate forecast for a project of this size as I, I I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you that. Um, but we, I want to tell you how we got to the number that we got to so that you understand the thought process. So what we did was we got some information about Justice Morden's review in terms of how much that cost. We received information that, uh, that the cost to the uh, board was 1.6 million or the city was 1.6 million. We got some information that the real cost of that review was a bit higher than that, 1.8 million. We amortized that to $2,018, which gets you just under 2 million. And then we added 25% to that in terms of what we're proposing. And we did that for a number of reasons. One, uh, we came to the conclusion that this review would be no less complicated than the Morden review, may well be more complicated. Uh, it's hard to predict, but we were certain, certainly confident that it wouldn't be less complicated uh, than what Justice Morden was doing. Second, I think most importantly, we are recommending a few additional 
features for the review that wa weren't part of the Morden review. First of all, uh, we are recommending a very robust community consultation process as part of this uh, independent review, including having a permanent advisor as part of the review team uh, to help organize and facilitate the community consultations. The second ask, and that obviously comes with both the, the consultation process and having an advisor on the review staff uh, would increase the cost. The second is that we are recommending that there be an advisory committee of people representing the affected communities that will advise the reviewer. And again, that will likely involve additional costs that was not part of Justice Morden's review. And then the third aspect, which we don't quite know how this will unfold is that we thought uh, there needs to be some consideration for the overhead and administrative costs of the review. As you will all know, uh, Justice Morden was part of a law firm uh, at the time that he did the review and those overhead costs were absorbed into the council fees. Depending on who the reviewer is that's appointed, that they may or may not already have office space that can house the review or they may need to find some independent or um, some office space and have staff to, to work on it. So we're making two recommendations to you. One, that you approve the draft terms of reference, which the working group understands will be considered by the reviewer. There'll be a further uh, consultation process before they're finalized again by this board, but we're, we're requesting that you approve those and that, that you um, approve adequate funds to be allocated for the review. I'm going to turn it over to Shacker to talk about some of the specific terms of reference. Thank you. Shacker, just Chair. before you start, let me, I, I, there's a downside to the technology and that it can time itself out. So uh, I apologize. I was struggling to find the other board, the committee members that uh, you uh, correctly identify them. But, but let me just say that, uh, Shacker, you and your colleagues, Ken Jeffers, who's here, but uh, Sarah Manaville and uh, Monica Forrester just did a phenomenal job and uh, thank you very much so we look forward to your comments thank you uh, chair pringle so what i'm going to do is uh, i'm not going to read out specific terms but i'm going to identify issues that certain terms uh, deal with and i'll flag what those terms are for those in the room uh, who have copies of the terms of reference who uh, want to go later on and, and examine what those are so first as Brees articulated, community consultation will be at the forefront of this review, uh, as it was at the forefront of the design of these terms of reference. And I think that's critically important to ensure that the review sets out to do um, the sort of rebuilding of trust uh, that we'd like it to. So some of the key terms that are drawn from what the community has expressed as its concerns. Uh, first, um, the issue of whether discretionary decisions on launching and resourcing missing person investigations are affected by implicit or explicit bias. And you will see this issue reflected in terms 2A and E. And what that term comes from is the perception uh, and experience of some members of the community that if you are an individual from a marginalized population, uh, whether that's based on sexual orientation, uh, race, uh, occupation, or what have you, uh, the experience that you have in entering a police station and making a report about a missing person may be different than if you are a member from another part of the city or have certain demographics. And so this term is designed to uh, identify that issue and critically examine it. And throughout the arc of the missing person investigation, from that initial entry into the police station all the way to any decisions made along the process. The second issue uh, is the importance of culturally competent expertise when interacting with marginalized communities. And this is reflected in term 2C. And the genesis uh, of that with respect to the community um, is the notion that uh, when you are anyone, including an officer, and you are dealing with a person who is from a different demographic group, a different way of life, uh, there is a need for a particular kind of informed expertise to understand their experiences. And that extends to 
uh, investigative theories or rationales about why someone went missing, where they might have been. Um, and this was something we also picked up in uh, other inquiries or reviews of missing persons, such as the one done in the aftermath of the Robert Picton case. Third is the concern around communication uh, between the TPS and uh, affected communities, including notification of public safety concerns. So certainly I think we're all aware in the media of concerns that the community had around communication. And the idea here is that there should be uh, a clarity between the force and between the community about what is being communicated, why and how. A key term is the question of whether there is adequate investigative consideration of serial killers based on missing person reports where there is no evidence of foul play. And certainly this is an issue that the community believes uh, was alive during the MacArthur investigation. So even though that investigation is completely off limits, the underlying issue that it raised certainly needs to be examined. And again, this is also something that came up in the aftermath of the Picton case and that review. The terms also examine uh, barriers to individuals being reported missing. So as we know, uh, in the case of some of MacArthur's victims, for example, two individuals were never reported missing in the first place. And so it's important the community felt uh, for the review to examine uh, what the barriers are for those who are particularly marginalized from being reported missing. Another key aspect that's being examined is, or that we hope to be examined, is the nature of the relationship between the force and the LGBTQ2S community. The perception in the community is that uh, the current nature of the relationship uh, may be with just a few uh, large-scale institutional actors, but not necessarily with those who represent marginalized or vulnerable subgroups. So the idea is that uh, there's a need for a critical examination of who that relationship is with within the community. There's also a term, uh, this is 3H, uh, about the impact of non-heteronormative sexual expression and how it affects willingness to interact and report uh, to the police. And this issue really reflects the genesis uh, of tension between the community and the police, uh, the, the bathhouse raids in the 1980s, um, and more recently things like the uh, Marie Curtis Park uh, cruising uh, crackdown whereby it's not only just uh, your sexual orientation that the community feels is an issue, uh, but also the form of sexual expression that you engage in and how that affects your comfort level with the police. The community also felt, uh, and you'll see this reflected on page 17 of the terms of reference, uh, that there was a need to examine prior reviews uh, in terms of missing person investigations and the relationship with the police. So we've named some of those reviews, including the review that the city commissioned in 1981 uh, between the, about the relationship between the homosexual community and the police, and uh, the importance of looking at all of those different reviews to ensure that they've been effectively implemented. And two final points. Uh, one is that, as you'll see on page 18, the terms of reference envision a robust framework for uh, some kind of independent oversight and monitoring uh, not only of those recommendations that have been implemented, uh, but also of their effectiveness. And finally, as, as, as Brees has mentioned, but I'd like to, to highlight again, this review uh, with appropriate protections, uh, we recommend should examine the missing person investigation component of the alleged victims of MacArthur uh, and the missing person investigations of Allura Wells and Tess Ritchie. So the working group hopes that with these draft terms of reference and with this review, uh, we'll begin to see a repair in public trust uh, and uh, a repair in terms of how the community feels about its safety. Mr. Carr, thank you very much. Uh, Breeze, is there anything else that you want to uh, add? Uh, then let me just say before I turn it over to my colleagues for questions, uh, we really appreciate the, all the hard work, all the effort uh, that you and uh, Shakira, the, the committee members with you put into it and Breeze, the facilitation that you did, the number of phone calls back and forth. So it's a very important uh, job and, and one very well done. So thank you, colleagues, with that. Questions, Councillor Hart? Just a very brief question. 
out of the process uh, and out of the review, will performance measures or metrics be developed so down the road we can measure how well we've done? That is incorporated into the terms of reference. Um, and you'll see that, let me find it. Um, so it's, it's, in a, it's under uh, pages 17 and 18 of our report, which talk about what types of recommendations you, if you adopt these, you would be asking the reviewer to provide to you. Um, and you'll see that a number of those involve elements about monitoring compliance with them and measuring compliance. And so we've added that into number four, number six, number seven of uh, what you, if you adopt these, what you would be asking the reviewer to, uh, to come back to you with in terms of recommendation. That was certainly at the forefront of the mind of the working group to make sure that there is a mechanism for uh, measuring and monitoring uh, implementation and ongoing compliance. And you'll see that there's also a, and a requirement for timelines for implementation for each of the, a request from you to the reviewer to provide a timeline for each rec uh, recommendation and implementation so that you do have something that you can measure it by. And, and one thing I'll add, just, just from the community perspective, uh, you'll see on page 18, number two, uh, that includes uh, examining the satisfaction of those who file or attempt to file missing person reports. So uh, we want to hear from the community how they feel directly about the performance of the service in that regard. Colleagues, any other questions? If not, Carlene, have you got the, 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 the oh, yes, the deputations, thank you. Um, so the first uh, deputation, uh, Jeffrey Tunney, if you guys could just well, stand maybe. by. <laughs> thank you. Is uh, Jeffrey Tunney here? Thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, I'll give you five minutes, and I'll give you uh, a one-minute uh, uh, signal uh, to let you uh, know that you're getting close to the end, OK? Yep. Are you ready? Yeah, these two dual things are for the chief of, uh, you'll have your names on there, for the chief of police and uh, the mayor because they're basically the summary of my report and my investigation into some things that have been going on as well as my research and my finding. For starters, yeah, I want to make this quick because like I said, you, like you said, I only have five minutes. So let's get started quickly. For starters, my name is Jeffrey Gitani. I was living at 447 Church Street for 13 years. My original plan with this project that when I got into 447 Church was to start my own business and, you know, have a lively. Oh, actually, let me sit down. Okay, let's start this again. My name is Jeffrey G. Tunney. I used to live at 447 Church Street for 13 years. Uh, my intentions were to actually start a business and carry on with life. But unfortunately, I got stopped by many people, including the police. You guys didn't really want me to do my business because you guys wanted me to cater to the youth. Right now, as we speak, um, by coincidence or by chance, I actually do have one person that can clarify that there was a lot of troubled youth that came to my place. Um, how do I put this? I've had a lot of problems with the corruption that has gone on. I'm not really happy with the gay community myself. I'm not too happy with their anger and their hate against the gay community for the simple fact that there's been a lot more other bad seeds that not just in the police department but in other, de other departments that have allowed some of, the, some of the things that have gone on. My concern is not just the missing people. My concern is the vulnerability. It's not the, it's not, what, what causes the missing thing to happen is the vulnerability. It's the vulnerability that gets people into drugs. It's the vulnerability that gets, in, that gets people into trouble. It's the vulnerability that gets people to break the law. It's the vulnerability that gets people to have sexual assaults done to them. It's the vulnerability that can get people missing, and it's the vulnerability that can get people killed. And that is what I've been trying to focus on, is trying to avoid vulnerability. With what I was doing was I was running a system that could prevent people from having their basic livelihood, figuring out plans, how to figure out the cracks of the system so they didn't have to prostitute themselves. We could figure out other ways to get them the drugs that they didn't have to sleep with old men to do it. And that's what we did. I got no help from the police. 
As a matter of fact, a lot of the police officers, when they found out that I was doing, they often came to me and approached me. They said, well, you shouldn't have to do this. Well, nobody else is, I felt. I felt that much of the places and much of the organizations were all asking for money, and while they were asking for money, they were still encouraging this. Now, I do have a proposal um, for myself, too, which is why I'm here. I really like to keep up with this project. It was doing good, and I finally realized that even yesterday, I, by fluke, I found out somebody actually improved on their life, and that changed me because for the past couple of months, I've been pretty down about. As most people know, um, one of my friends that I lived with or, you know, was helping out, got whatever. So this is what I would like to do. I do have a proposal, and John Turry, I actually heard you over the weekend on my way back from a camping trip, and you're into funding. And I can actually do this by myself, and I can. I don't need any funding from anybody. I figured out that if, as long as I can get, which is roughly 6.5 million, which means I can buy the properties and that kind of stuff, which gives the assets, as well as I can actually, and I've already talked to a businessman, if you can come up with this, I can actually make a payment of $450,000 yearly, and then I can pay this back in 17 years if I can get this. And I swear I will do everything I can. I've had a lot of problems. Um, I also come from other things in the past too because I know about these vulnerability situations. I know what is done. I, I know some of the games that have been played because unfortunately with me, there was a major big crime that was going on in London, Ontario and it was transferred over to Toronto and I'm the only one, the only one that ever survived from what these guys were doing to the people that were doing in London. Over 33 boys were killed, and they were found dead and overdosed, and not one of these men have ever been charged. They were only charged with their porn and with their stuff that they were doing. Um, it's up to you. I do know also that if you do help me with this, I can make you a promise that, uh, and I've already spoken to Anne Marie, which, by the way, is Anne Marie's birthday yesterday, so happy birthday to her. But I've already said to her, and I think this is a great idea, that she has an Anne Marie Center in Nova Scotia. And I'm having a hard time because Anne Marie is actually what helped make the Canadian industry. But because of her retirement, we've lost a lot of funding in Toronto because she, th her music and everything was in the center of place. So what I was thinking with Anne is because we're having a hard time with making the sales eat in Nova Scotia and to help with this project, what we could do is we could call it or open it up as an Anne Marie's headquarters. And then what we could do is with her products and whatever that she's got in Nova Scotia, we could ship them to Spring, we could spread them to Toronto. And then that way what we can do is we can sell them, which would make it a lot more easier for her. I, have a, I assure you at the Anne Marie Center is all for it because of course they should have sales for it. Jeffrey, so uh, thank you. My finance you. is probably up by now, um, yes. but it's up to you guys what you guys want to do. Well, you've put the proposal before us. Uh, are there any questions, colleagues? If not, Jeffrey, thank you very much for your deposition and for your documentation to the chief and the mayor. All right. Thank you. So the next deputation from uh, Brian Demetis. Brian, you know, five minutes, I'll give you the one minute warning. Thank you. Um, well, I'm glad to see this important review is finally being implemented. Turn your mic on. In the mic. Hello. Testing? Yep, thank okay. you. God damn, this is not for short people. I'm glad, blah, blah, blah. The four key issues that need to be addressed in this review that I think need to be highlighted are the proper community consultation, determining the level of police cultural competency of two S2 LGBTQ communities and intersecting marginalized identities. Number three is barriers to access regarding folks being unreported and feeling unsafe to share info with police. Number four would be reviewing the resources dedicated for missing investigation cases by the TPS and to see if that is sufficient. Proper community consultation needs to be extensive and accessible. It has to have a chance on producing the best results that will have meaningful impacts. For community consultations, we, ex 
we will need to break it down barriers for folks to have to sharing their knowledge and lived experiences for having ASL interpretation sh should be available at every meeting. Consulting questions should be available to be filled online and in person. The questions and materials should be available in multiple languages to obtain the high range of communities that are not regularly heard in these reviews. Part of the community consultation must have a strategic outreach plan that directly outreach underserved and marginalized communities. Therefore, this review can be as thorough as possible. This includes the input of folks with lived experience, with marginalized identities, as well as consulting those with expertise in fields like, but not limited to, mental health, addictions, and those working with communities that are in poverty and those who are working in the field of sex work. This review must have a mechanism on reviewing and, grand and grading the overall cultural competences of Toronto Police Services with regards to marginalized communities from informative training that centers on de-escalation and cultural competence on marginalized communities, the grading of knowledge for individual police officers and year-round mandatory training for police officers, and a review of training materials and policies that conform to the highest of standards that center on serving all the public, including the unique challenges of cultural norms that exist in each community. For meaningful impact, we must determine and review all the factors and barriers that communities and individuals have with regards to reporting and communicating with police. This review must look at why changes are needed, why, why and what changes need to happen. In this case, the folks do not get reported missing. We must look at the circumstances and barriers that prevented dealing this risk and Krishna Kumar from being reported missing and in the case of Laura Wells to be reported in a timely manner where police take all missing cases seriously. For cases, for cases like undocumented folks, folks in sex work and or substance users are involved, we must adopt a practice and policy of a sanctuary model where folks who are involved where for cases of undocumented folks, sex workers and substance users are involved, we must adopt a sanctuary model where folks who are undocumented or involved in sex work and substance abuse will not be prosecuted for going to the police with any matter. That friends and family and community members come to the police without fear of arrest for the individuals being reported missing. This must be centered in the review and recommendations that come out. Without violating the terms of not reviewing the active case of Bruce McCarthy, this review must look at the victims of Bruce McCarthy, the case and projects that came before the charges and what went wrong and why it took police so long to respond and to wrongfully conclude all these projects from Project Prism to Project Houston and cases that put many members of the community in danger. These tragedies One minute, Brian. need to be reviewed so it won't happen again, so lives will not be at risk again. This review can look at all the victims of Bruce McCarthy without violating the reviewing mandate. That also includes cases of Laura Wells and Tess Ritchie and the negligence of the police that took part in their investigation. Without looking at these cases, this review will miss an opportunity for meaningful life-saving changes that TPS can, update, can adopt. Finally, part of the review must evaluate the resources the police have with regards to missing person cases if funds and personnel are adequate to meet the needs required to proper investigation to all missing person cases in Toronto. I hope this board adopts in full the term of reference with strict timelines and recommendations for accountability. I am sick of losing community members due to police negligence, and hopefully these are first steps to meaningful change in TPS operations. Thank you, Brian. Uh, colleagues, any questions for Brian? Okay, Brian, thanks again. Uh, next, uh, Susan Gupta. Hi, Susan. Thank you. Wow. Five minutes, and I'll give you the one-minute warning. Oh, and what an impressive group of people we have here. I'll just start my own clock. Um, <laughs> Mine's one that counts. <laughs> Glad to be back. Uh, happy Pride, everyone. Um, we're um, at that part of the, the month. Let me get the right range on the mic here. 
So I just came from a train. My name's Susan Gapka. I'm here as a community member, concerned community member. I was last here when uh, we talked about this matter, and the committee, the process for getting here was uh, created, and um, um, and we've come a long way since then. I just came from a academic forum, Trans Matters keynote by Jin Harita Warren. And uh, they were critiquing our life at Church and Wellesley and how it um, policing affects disadvantaged communities. So I just wanted to remind you that we are all being studied here by academics in this process. Um, the second point I wanted to make was uh, that I wanted to thank you for relaxing security when I came in today. You know, I had the good fortune of receiving a key to the city on May 17th. I thought I might need it, need it to get through, <laughs> <laughs> to get in today without being searched. And you beat me to it because actually, but thank you for listening to that concern. And, um, um, lifting that search criteria for being able to come to this public meeting. You could even go further, but that's a topic for another day. Um, on the terms of reference, I'm here in support of the committee and the work that was done. Um, I want to actually really appreciate the committee members reaching out to various community members. We've had a series of discussions and, con and conversations since the last time. And I want to particularly uh, call out uh, Maggie's and it's, I want to make sure I get the ASAP, um, Alliance for, Alliance for South Asian AIDS Prevention. As a white person, I'm here to stand in solidarity, to be here in solidarity and support with the fantastic work you're doing. And how difficult this process has been for us personally and professionally. This terms of reference does not address the demand for a public inquiry, but it does satisfy several other concerns that we brought forward um, at the last time. And the m I'm, it's probably easier if I put it up there. Um, number three, the robust community consultation is the piece that I'm most happy about. And um, it talks, uh, I've written down some other models that I think that's critical. And that's in a governance model how these are better accomplished around to resolve the, the implementation gap between a policy board such as this or what happens at the city and having community members actually involved in the process. And I've written down three types of things that I think are important in that, just because I like to make notes while I'm waiting my turn. And, um, but the other piece in here, it talks about it's recommended the reviewer hire an advisor who will organize and facilitate those community consultation processes. Thank you. And um, that what we have here is some people on the committee who are extremely, um, who have developed a positive relationship and should be, if willing, Part, want to be part of that consultation process because where the implementation breaks down is when you hire a third party consultation firm that may or may not have that relationship with the community and that's the really important piece of trust and uh, relationship building that we don't want to lose that. I think uh, those are my comments for today. I'm in support and in solidarity with uh, the terms of reference that are coming forward. I'm sure I'll read the full report in a day or two and find something that was uncomfortable, but through community consultation and through your, um, your, um, your responsiveness, uh, we will be able to sort through that. 
Thank you. Susan, thank you. Thank you for coming in March and uh, talking to us as well. And thank you for coming back uh, now. Comments uh, or questions, uh, colleagues of Susan? Okay, Susan, thank you very much. Happy uh, Pride. <laughs> happy Pride. Uh, Chris Langenfeld? Chris, you know the rules? They haven't changed? <laughs> well, I'll start by making sure the mic's on, because I know from having been forced to watch it online, often the mic isn't on when people first begin speaking. Um, just a, uh, a quick comment on, on this item. Um, I simply felt that the uh, terms of reference should include uh, that uh, any information that is collected in relation to the MacArthur case, obviously you don't want to interfere with the investigation or the prosecution, um, but that uh, it should be included in the terms of reference that the reviewer should then uh, prepare a third report with that information that uh, I'm presuming that the at uh, once the prosecution and investigations of MacArthur are completed that there will be a call obviously for a public inquiry or for a review of specifically the MacArthur uh, situation so I'd uh, suggest you step out in front of that now put in your terms of reference both that uh, you expect that there will be that review uh, and that any information that's collected be compiled and passed on then to that reviewer so that there's no duplication of work uh, more than necessary and so that anything that is found out in that regard uh, can already, the, uh, the MacArthur review then can have a running start on that. Um, and I'll, I'll just mention since I'm actually going to have to leave so I'm not going to uh, get time to speak to the other two items, uh, one of the things I was going to mention was body-worn cameras and you'll notice I've uh, got a hundred and fifty I, I personally was not going to bring it up but uh. <laughs> well for this is the hundred and fifty to two hundred dollar poor man's option with a battery that's good for five days and so I think we can beat the uh, the service I think is coming in at somewhere around twenty six thousand dollars per officer that's going to be equipped with cameras uh, in their uh, 85 million 10-year number so uh, I, I certainly think we can uh, do better than that and Hopefully I will be back for uh, future board meetings and that'll be in the next capital budget. So I'll speak on that more then. Chris, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, questions of Chris, colleagues? Thank you, Chris. Oh, uh, the, I just wanted to, I think you know the process to be followed, I think, is that once the reviewer has been identified, the terms of reference will go there for a quick review. So there may be a chance there to, uh, to address that point you made. Uh, just in case it isn't, it's, it's hard to deal with here and draft it up and have the working group see it and so forth. But there will be a chance back here for that point you just made to be, uh, to be canvassed. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, Breeze and uh, Shakir, if you want to come back and uh, and uh, Carlene, have you got the uh, motions that we'll put up? Thank you again for uh, all the work that's been done. Uh, and uh, Shakir, if you can make sure that gets passed on to your colleagues who aren't here, I would appreciate it as well. Um, we're just going to put up because there are four, as you see in your. Um, in your uh, report, in my report rather, uh, there are four uh, recommendations to adopt. Okay. And we get that one slide front and center. Perfect. So there are the recommendations, um, colleagues. You see them in the report. Um, is there any discussion, uh, uh, Mayor Tory? Well, I'm, I'm preempted by what's already up there, but uh, I'll get to the uh, to the one small change I wanted to make, which has been reflected in the, what's on the screen. But I want to begin by, first of all, saying, and we sort of said it at the beginning, but to just to repeat the thanks uh, of uh, certainly myself as the mayor, and, uh, but as a member of this board as well, to uh, the committee and to Greece and to all those involved. Because I think one of the great things about this that's a, 
it's been a great uh, uh, learning experience uh, for me again, which is that when you, from the beginning of a process, involve people uh, in the community, I think again, we'll see, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic it's going to turn out to be a very useful and successful and constructive and healing uh, report, but I think we started on a good foot by, by consulting and that was the work that you all uh, did. And I think um, when I was initially conceiving of, of this uh, mechanism, it was an attempt to make sure that we were not uh, prevented in terms of time from beginning to address some real anxieties and concerns and issues that were felt by the community and trying to get some answers on that um, so that we could try and shape something that could be done now, um, recognizing there were other things that might have to be done later and that the ultimate objective, of course, or one of the ultimate objectives was to respect the integrity of other judicial and criminal uh, proceedings. And I would just say that I think the outcome, looking at these terms of reference, uh, which are extensive and you have to read them carefully, um, I think as much as could be expected, it is something that has been, you know, crafted in in, in, in large measure by the community, <coughs> pardon me, um, and with the support of the community. And the change that I alluded to, as somebody with an eagle eye, like Mr. Langenfeld will have already spotted that uh, we've got the number three million dollars up there and I, the more I listened and the more I read when I saw the terms of reference and the more I sort of thought about um, how long this could take and, and, uh, you know, and, and the complexity of the issues, the complexity of dealing with the issues in terms of the reviewer and everybody else having to kind of you know, draw those lines that are clearly drawn by the terms of reference but there'll be decision points along the way as to exactly how that line is applied and um, the more we are meaningful in terms of the consultation and engagement, because I think, uh, Sakir, when you were speaking, you were talking about not just consultation with the community, but the engagement of the community, the more I felt it was better, and, and I'm one of those, it's unusual for, for me to put forward motions involving the expenditure of more money than was actually already authorized by the Executive Committee of the City last week, or this week, I guess it was. Um, but I just think that we should maybe set the upside a, a bit higher, and that's not with the, uh, uh, with the necessity of spending more, but it's at least to put the upside at a slightly higher level so that if it takes a bit more time or if the consultation, uh, you know, costs a bit more money or even the legal advice that we have to seek, uh, when I say we, that the, the board's reviewer has to seek along the way is, um, uh, is uh, necessitated that somebody won't have to come back here and go through all the delay of, of asking. Uh, for uh, for that and so obviously I'm sure the reviewer and their counsel and so forth will expend as little money as possible to get the job done properly and completely but nonetheless I think just having this uh, slight um, uh, slightly enhanced number uh, will will uh, will be helpful uh, because I think if you look at what this is all about it's about uh, obtaining answers it's about rebuilding trust it's about saving lives somebody mentioned that in the uh, deputations going forward. So um, I will just, the, the amendment allows us, the board, to ask the executive committee of, of the city, of which I chair, to at its next meeting um, just reconsider the amount that was already approved to make sure the upside number um, is there or an upside number uh, so as to make sure that the maximum, and it says up to that number, resources are available to make sure that uh, there isn't some interruption to have to come back and, and get more, but obviously with the theory thinking that they'll do it for as little as they can, but get it done properly. And I just want to again reiterate um, how confident I am because of this solid beginning that we can move forward and have a solid uh, report that will be received that will, um, you know, serve to be very useful in all of those things that I talked about, obtaining answers, rebuilding trust, and, and indeed uh, saving lives and, and relieving anxieties of people going forward. Um, because I can't imagine anything more distress, distressful than having someone missing in your life or in your community or in your family. So uh, thank you again very much for your, uh, for your leadership and for your work. So we'll be moving that amendment. Mayor Tory, that motion that I could captures your uh, recommendation and, and uh, colleagues, are there any other comments, questions uh, of, uh, of our uh, committee or any uh, comments on the, if not, there is a motion which Mayor Tory uh, will move uh, on the board, uh, which says that we will approve recommendations one, two, and three. Uh, and that the following motion of the board forward the request of the city executive committee for the July 17, 2018 meeting to allocate the transfer of funds to the Toronto Police Service Board funding for the review uh, an amount not exceeding $3 million and such funds be available to the board beginning 2018 until the conclusion of the review. Does that capture it all, Mayor Tory? So you're putting the motion on the table. Any further discussion? If not, may I have a seconder? Ms. Chandra Casera, all in favor? Any contrary? 
carried unanimously. Thank you, uh, Shakir and Breeze, and thank you for, because, you know, the presentation went easily, but I've seen the work done behind it. <laughs> so thank you very much, first of all, for putting your names forward, and second of all, for doing it. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. That's thank great. You. Thank you. And thank you. Talk to the reviewer. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's uh, move on into uh, item number seven, which is, I think seven is next, right, Carlene? Yeah, uh, seven is the, uh, the way forward. There's not a presentation uh, for that, but there is uh, deputations, and the first one is uh, uh, Miguel uh, Avil uh, Valarde. I haven't started the thing yet, just Miguel, testing. just wait. <laughs> just testing, testing. Happy Aboriginal days. Um, it's good to see that uh, Mayor Tori's been awake since five in the morning. Well, thank you, Mr. Tori. Thank you so much for making the, the land acknowledgement today at the board. Oh my God, how long have we uh, been waiting for this? Two years? But finally it's here. Thank you so much. Um, in relation to, um, to what uh, Susan Gappa and everybody has added. It feels good to, to that uh, the people can come to a city, to uh, the pew at, at, the, at the Toronto Police Headquarters and not to be afraid. Not to be afraid of bullies that, that want to silence us because we want to say what the right things are to, to the public of Toronto. Um, I want to bring to attention one advice as we move forward with this um, project, um, my councillor um, Trossi, uh, Lucy, and councillor Wontang have um, achieved uh, something very important to uh, have the attention of the mayor as, as we have difficulties in, in shaping, improving our streets collection, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things I have mentioned to councillor Trossi is the, the issue of, of horse poo in our streets. Um, I wonder what is the, the process for collection of horse poo on our streets. I emailed Sergeant um, Graham Quinn um, in, with the intention of finding out what is the steps to, f how is the collection done? He never replied to me, he said. Sergeant Graham Quinn never replied to me. So I wonder if uh, the two, uh, um, ladies over there watching me can make an effort to reach out to Sergeant Queen and tell me what is the process for poo collection in the city of Toronto. I want to read the, la the last paragraph. It says, is if, uh, on, the, on the website, if you have any issues with the collection of manure left by Toronto police horses, call 311. I called 311. Nothing happened. So I emailed um, this individual. He never replied to me. And it's sad to say, it's sad to, it's sad to say that it took like three, four days to pick up. Um, and the same look, and it happened over, and it is something that we need to move forward. Maybe eliminating the horses after all, because this belongs to the last century. Remember they were used to horse, the horses to chase the Indians? Come on, we don't want to see horses on our street. Why are they, the need for horses anyhow? Is to, to pet them? Uh, or or, or what are you, you, you want to use them in case there is a riot? I mean, I don't, I don't see the purpose of having horses on our street. If they talk about using technology and blah, 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 I think horses are part of the past. So with that thought, I want to leave you, and, and uh, hopefully that accountability is also part of the, and transparency is also part of the equation. So if someone connect uh, a, a sergeant staff for a question, he needs to reply between five days. But this is the expectation of the city ombudsman. But the, pr the problem is the city ombudsman does not have oversight on the Toronto Police Services. So it's something that governance needs to be looking into it, the governance part. And also, um, I see two chairs uh, um, empty, Councillor Chin Lee uh, left, um, and there was one member of the board who's not in today. Um, I was at the city advisory for the disability um, and access, and I advised and talked to Mr. Mr. Tory in an effort to increase presence of disability members and, and minorities. 
at this table so we can have a, a, a much better conversation the, of the issues that affect us as the end users. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Any questions uh, for Miguel? Okay. Um, thank you. The next uh, is uh, Derek uh, Moran. I just want to say by me speaking at this meeting, this shall not be deemed to be in any way my consent expressed or implied, and doing so is fraud. God bless Her Majesty the Queen and long live Her Majesty the Queen. I just want to thank Councillor Perks for saying something on Twitter yesterday that reminded me that the transformational task force, a lot of you are focused on the financial aspect of it and like paring down costs. What I recall is a lot of the focus from of Dr. Alok Mukherjee was however on the culture change in regards to not the not just the police but like the board could do with a little bit of upgrading also and i just want to um uh, remind you that transformation can also go f uh, be for the worse and this is from what councillor perks alluded to yesterday is this is um <clears throat> how to create a socialist state by saul alinsky there are eight levels of control and I just want to, he's gone now, but I just want to thank Chris Langenfeld for doing something to relieve that control somewhat. That must be obtained before you are able to create a socialist state. The first is the most important one. Healthcare, control healthcare and you control the people. Two, poverty. Increase the poverty level as high as possible. Poor people are easier to control and will not fight back if you are providing everything for them to live. Three, debt. Increase the debt to an unsustainable level. That way you are able to increase taxes and this will produce more poverty. Four, gun control. Remove people's ability to defend themselves from the government. That way you are able to create a police state. Five, welfare. Take control of every aspect of their lives, food, housing, and income. Six, education. Take control of what people read and listen to. Take control of what children learn in school, think common core. Seven, religion. Remove the belief in God from the government and schools. Eight, class warfare. Divide the people into the wealthy and the poor. This will cause more discontent, and it will be easier to take tax the wealthy with the support of the poor. Now, what reminds me of this board, and to be fair, all the boards and committees over at uh, you know, the City Hall, is six, education. Take control of what people read and listen to. Because really, when you think about it, when we come to these meetings, we only learn what you people want us to learn. Like, you control what we read and what we listen to. And, you know, what Chris Langenfeld did, he's got me thinking, if I did the same thing by taking the board to court, what would Fred Fisher say as the defense for you people not answering our questions? You wouldn't believe the number of case, like, Supreme Court case law that I've, I've uh, uh, amassed where it talks about the right, the, the public's right to be informed. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I mean, I'd love to hear what he'd have to say. So, you know, I mentioned this at the um, the meeting regarding tasers at the YMCA. You love to, you all love to talk about transparency and accountability, but when it, and I've even explained to Meritorious Ex Executive Committee, one of the definitions for accountable in Black's Law Dictionary is answerable. I remember when Joe Oliver almost bowled me over at his Canada Day picnic, that fateful Canada Day picnic, I first had my, my first conversation with Mayor Tory, ironically, and Joe Oliver said to me, yeah, like, the, the people own the government. The government's owned by the people. Like, yeah, I, well, by what authority, by what right do you people dare not answer our questions regarding a material fact and information? So, I mean, Sometimes I just want to come here and give you all notice about what the law actually is. I don't have any questions. I want you to be remembered, Chair Pringle. No, seriously, I'm being serious here. Don't laugh. Because there was a moment where the first time I ever saw this lady, this lawyer here, this member of the Law Society, was when you had her sit at the table and you told me before the meeting started that if you have any questions, I have Carl here, and then you announced that to be, when I start talking, I have two lawyers sitting at the table just in case you have any questions. I didn't happen to have any questions that day. It's just the way the <laughs> cookie crumbled. So two months later, I ask a question, and I get shut down. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, do I create a scene? Do I create a stir? Or, like, what's going on here? Someone obviously got to Chair Pringle. 
and told him, don't allow this guy to ask questions. Well, you just looked at Meritori when I said that, so maybe it was him. <laughs> but Keep going, Derek. You've got 30 seconds. <laughs> but before, because you mentioned a couple months ago that you think frequently about uh, resigning as uh, chair of the board. So I just want to set a good example for Upala, the next chair of the police services board. I want her to know through your actions that Derek, you know what, you're absolutely right. We have no authority and uh, right whatsoever to uh, tell you people that you can't ask, you know, public servants. Councillor Davis just said she's not running for council again. She said it was an honor to serve. I don't mean to be rude, but serve, that implies you're all subordinates of ours. You are supposed to answer our questions. Derek, thank you very much. As always, uh, Dion Rene. Uh, Dion, uh, five minutes, and uh, let me know when you're ready. Is this an adjustable chair? Don't know. Okay, Dion. As mentioned earlier by Miguel, today is June 21st, National Indigenous Peoples Day. And uh, the way that this board permits the police services to transform itself has an impact on Indigenous peoples and the rest of society. I'm curious as to the person who was heading this task force, Superintendent Frank Bergen, what happened to him? I'm not aware that the, the public was informed as to why the person who was heading the task force is no longer heading the task force. So it leaves some questions in my mind. Uh, there's a, on page one of this uh, documentation that was included in this package, uh, I see that there's, it seems to be or appears to be copy and paste of information from last year. On the first page, it refers to the hiring moratorium. We spoke about that last year. And as this board is aware, you temporarily lifted the moratorium to allow some officers to be hired. So it becomes curious as to why it's not updated in the information that you have, because you have knowledge of that. Um, it doesn't appear that way on the record. And it's pertinent for information to be accurate on the record. On page three of your documentation, the first paragraph, if people would be so willing to open up their documents and look at it so they can follow what I'm saying. Um, it says, as requested by the board, the purpose of the quarterly report is to provide sh stakeholders and status updates on the implementation of the recommendations to March 31st, 2018. So I'm just curious as to why it doesn't necessarily appear accurate as of March 31st, 2018. Um, it says this includes details regarding achievements and progress, as well as risks or issues and require mitigation or further escalation. Um, a lot of this reporting and on these pages indicates all these great things about the police, but I'm wondering, do the police ever report anything about their failings? I don't see that, and I think that's something that's very important for the public to, to see whether or not the service is acknowledging where they're failing. Uh, the public or that the board requires that. I see that you have uh, charts, these charts, and I believe the first one is page 42 of your document, but these pages are not numbered and it may be difficult for you to find, but it's titled as recommendation number one, connected officer. And one of the keys identifies what is off track, that's the square, and if you have color, it's red and it indicates that your budget is off track. And so I'm wondering where the board takes initiative 
to find out why it's off track, because there's no indication necessarily in here other than some things that we might be guessing at. And I think it's helpful for the public to have clear information so that we can be assured that this board is doing what we expect of it to do, and that is to oversee police services. On page, uh, the following page, uh, uh, it identifies number three. Now, I know it's back to front, so, but none, notwithstanding, it's the following page. And it says disband Tavis. And this board well remembers why Tavis was disbanded. And I know prior to the provincial election, there was some talk about reestablishing Tavis. And I would trust that this board maintains its purposes as to why Tavis was disbanded and not to reinstate it. Uh, on the page that's documented as a recommendation. Recommendation number nine, it says a risk-based response to special events. That, in my opinion, ties in with uh, recommendation 15, overhauling paid duties. Uh, on both of those pages, your, your indicators under, uh, with regards to the project health are outstanding. It's, it's saying it's off track. Um, and I'm wondering where the board uh, challenges the police services as to get those things implemented. On recommendation 15, and on this recommendation, it indicates it's off track because you don't have project staffing. So that means, based on the key information, that you don't have staff to implement these aspects of this project. And I'm wondering why that is and why this board has allowed it for, to go on this long. If there's overpaid, sorry, maybe the same thing, overhauling paid duties um, and, and suggestions that there's not enough police as the Police Services Association is claiming because the police are tied up with special events which are off duty instead of uh, duty work, uh, we need to look at that and have a clarity as to why the board allows that to take place. Those are uh, my submissions for this agenda item. Uh, the, the, the task force, I know uh, Staff Sergeant Watts is not here, who's, uh, or is he, okay, but up to you. No, if, if there are any points of clarification that the board may have, I, I definitely will bring um, Acting Inspector Watts up. Um, I can tell you that from uh, uh, implementation perspective, the connected officer piece has been uh, something that has been uh, in progress as, as part of the pilot. But this year, we're looking at 700 distributions. We uh, yeah, implemented a small footprint of 236 and 51 division a couple of months ago. The feedback has been very positive. We're expanding it to the 54, 55 uh, district model um, very shortly. Um, the, there are some opportunities for enhancing as we now start to go operational and looking at other components across the service from specialized units, et cetera. Um, on uh, July 27th, we'll, be, uh, uh, we'll have our first batch of special constables rolled out. We're excited about that and what that can bring in the opportunities, uh, which aligns directly with looking at the reduction of the frontline pressures that are existing right now, um, looking at other opportunities and looking at calls that we have the opportunity to deflect, uh, giving it to the rightful owners rather than uh, the uh, frontline officers who inherit quite a bit of, um, of uh, having to uh, um, uh, take on those tasks is, is the third component uh, as well. Um, uh, I'm not sure if there's anything more that, uh, you know, if the board is, is specific to some points and questions, I can definitely address that, but there are many angles to, uh, to consider. Uh, Dion, thank you very much. Uh, Sorry, Chair Pringle. Uh, Dion, thank you I, very I much. I make an apology because I know with my time I did have a few seconds. And uh, no, I, you actually didn't. On page six, it says, "Why? Um, what does this mean? Uh, you have something about 45% response rate, but there's no uh, clarification okay. of what that means. Thank you, So Dion. I think the board needs to make it clear for the public when we read these documentations. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, uh, any questions on the, the report? Anything you want further uh, elaboration on? If not, may I have a motion then to um, approve uh, item number seven? Sorry, receive. Uh, it is uh, to receive the deputations and approve the report, isn't it? Yes, receive the deputations and approve 
approve the report. Uh, may I have a proposal for that? Uh, Councillor Hart, seconded Mr. Jeffers. All in favor? In the contrary? Thank you. Item number, uh, item number 10, uh, Ms. Senator Casario, you held that. Thank you for this. I just have a question. Sorry. I know that um, $20 seem, doesn't seem like a lot for many of us, but for those on social assistance, it is a barrier. And um, especially I know clients that I've worked with who require a check for volunteer purposes or students. I'm just wondering if the service has contemplated the idea of a sliding scale, because I, I think this is one of the services that the public uses the most, is the reference check. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. We basically developed the service in terms of trying to recover our costs, and we actually can't charge more than that. Uh, we have consulted with other jurisdictions to see if our costs are in line with what they're charging. Uh, so I don't think we've actually looked at a sliding scale. We certainly charge more if people want an expedited uh, uh, check, uh, but that's not something that we've really looked at. I suppose that satisfy you? Okay. Any other questions, colleagues? If not, a motion to uh, approve uh, item number 10. Uh, Councillor Hart, seconded. Upla, uh, all in favor? Any contrary? Okay, carried, thank you. Um, Item number 12, uh, there is, uh, and this is the response to the LOCU um, uh, uh, inquest, and uh, there's one deputation, so there's more than one deputation, there's four. So the first one is Jennifer Chambers. Jennifer, thank you. You know the rules, five minutes? Yes, thanks. One minute warning. Okay, good. Uh, so the Empowerment Council represents um, people with mental health or addiction issues, so people who've been in crisis. Uh, I've attended as a party or witness uh, 11, um, or inquests into 11 people who died in encounters with police, uh, not all Toronto, um, but it is enough to make you cry and it, and it often does. Uh, we're also vitally concerned with the 27,500 other uh, interactions that Toronto Police Service has with people who have been in, um, in the system. The Empowerment Council had standing at the LOCU interest, inquest. We negotiated with other parties. We came out with joint recommendations. And we've been involved with a number of the initiatives that have resulted. We, there's two areas that we think need particular attention. Um, one is uh, acquiring objective data from the field for analysis. I think that this is a fundamental to be able to make good decisions. And the other is communities initiatives that are mentioned in the recommendations um, need resources um, to be realistically implemented. Uh, the Toronto Police College does indeed show annual training to members of the Toronto Police Services Board Mental Health Subcommittee and on occasion to the Pacer Subcommittee. Um, and I hope that such information will also be offered to the new committee representing racialized communities. A welcome addition to this consultative process would be talking to the community earlier on uh, so the community can identify and influence the choice of content rather than just fine tune the content at the end. The scenario based training I've seen at the college has been very well done. There's many excellent teachers at the college, some of whom I've seen here today, Stacy, Bonnie. Um, I don't have as high an opinion of the simulation training as a means of learning de-escalation. Um, in terms of the dialogue mentioned between members and community representatives, um, it was a, a well-meant and good try, but I don't think it was effective because there was no resources dedicated. It's very difficult for people to take any kind of regular time out of their primary jobs and come all the way to the police college and in order to engage in dialogue with the members of the college. Again, um, for this to be consistently and realistically implemented well, there has to be resources dedicated. Um, 
The features of training that were emphasized on page 26 are as they should be, but they, they all require time, uh, which I know people are told at the college that they have the op they should use, um, but p police in the field report that they feel a constant pressure of time. Uh, it's often pointed out that the use of force model includes the option of no force. Uh, I think this would be a little more obvious if force wasn't the name of the... Um, the wheel. So I really encourage Toronto Police Service to lead Ontario and find another term for describing um, that wheel of decision making that police officers use. Uh, I'm wondering if, if we're going to have access to aggregate data um, that's going to be um, derived from interviews with training coordinators and supervisors and in, in field training session observance of students by coordinators. Again, I think this would be very important in the field data for people to have to make decisions about including this board. Uh, I was con concerned to learn that the implicit association test and the intercultural development program, neither will be mandatory for police officers. I believe this is a product of the collective agreement. And I think that there's a problem with the collective agreement if, if such tests can't be required. Um, again, the exposing or conti continuing to expose officers and training to the perspectives and lived experience, racialized communities, the black community, and individuals' mental health issues or addiction. Uh, we highly support this um, uh, recommendation, but to the best of my knowledge, um, even this limited personal interaction is not taking place anymore because, as I said, there's not resources dedicated to enable it. Uh, I'm we're happy to learn that certification and use of force depends on competence and de-escalation. We're wondering if this extends to showing um, competence and de-escalation in the field as well as at the college. Alternative communication strategies, I know are taught at the college. I've attended many inquests, though I've never yet heard of an alternative communication strategy being used uh, when police are uh, requiring, uh, yelling at someone to drop their weapon. Uh, of course, we want people to drop their weapon, but it's not always going to happen when people are in crisis and very stressed um, without, without de-escalating them as part of the process. CEWs, as you've heard from us before, are not supported by us. We believe they're used disproportionately against people with mental health issues. We do support the use of shields and helmets on calls where something identified as a weapon is involved to enhance the possibility of cover, containment, and the opportunity to de-escalate, again, all of which requires the vital ingredient of time. Uh, yes, one minute, thank you. Um, I have seen the draft mental health strategy. I want to compliment Chris Bodie and Peter Lennox for facilitating this. I think it's very promising. And we look forward um, to the Mental Health Committee of the Police Services Board having input um, into it. Um, uh, the consultation process um, for competencies um, that are being implemented at the Toronto Police Service uh, was very good, and we hope that it will be um, ongoing. Uh, creating a routine order for members to utilize crisis centers, I think, is an excellent plan. Um, and we, and regarding the MCIT, we encourage that there be um, greater use of people with de-escalation skills, um, perhaps where dispatch officers actually get um, calls so that they might be able to uh, assist with the calls themselves, and also to be available to officers in the field as a resource to consult when they're on calls where the MCIT team cannot themselves personally attend. Thank you. of Jennifer? If not, uh, Jennifer, thank you, and you've given us a written submission as well, so we appreciate it. Just thank you very much. Say we, we do um, ask if the board would support um, resourcing some of these initiatives, perhaps jointly talking to the ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, colleague Steve Lurie is not here, but he has sent us also a written um, uh, submission in your package. So with that, I'd ask uh, Asifa Sarang and Howard uh, Morton from Across Boundaries to come up and uh, make their submission. Thank you both for coming. Thank you. So I think you both know the rules. I'll give you five minutes. I'll give you the one minute warning. <laughs> Thanks. The rule doesn't change if there are two people? Nah, I've tried, they've tried that before. <laughs> right. <laughs> thank you, though. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you. My name is Asifa Sarang. I'm the executive director at Across Boundaries and um, also a member of the Andrew Local Coalition. Okay. 
Um, my name is Asifa Sarang. I'm the Executive Director at Across Boundaries and also a member of the Andrew Local Coalition. And with me is Howard Morton, who was our uh, legal counsel uh, in the inquest and is also a member of the coalition. So thank you for allowing us to speak this morning. Um, it's in regards to the, um, the report that was submitted by Chief Saunders, and I want to start by acknowledging the comprehensiveness of the report and the detailed response to the different recommendations. Unfortunately, it also felt like a standardized checkbox process, which while we tick off complete, uh, completion, we're also putting our racialized and um, black bodies in different boxes in the ground. One of the most important recommendations we had put forward at the inquest was recommendation 12 on changing the culture of the institution, and we don't think it was understood or responded to in the way it was meant. The report indicates the level and amount of training that exists, and indeed there is lots of it, yet training alone does not change the culture of the organization. For organizational change to occur, you need commitment from the leadership, policies to support that commitment, and uh, uh, implementation of those changes and then an evaluation to ensure that those changes are in fact being embedded, embedded in the culture, followed by sanctions if that doesn't happen. This change starts from you, from the board, and the chief, yet this report was silent on this. Andrew's death was a colossal tragedy, but from this tragedy, change can happen if the service was willing to look upon areas of improvement rather than simply restating what already exists and extolling its virtues. There needs to be an overhaul, public opinion of the interactions of officers with those in mental health distress and from racialized black communities is not high. Could Andrew's situation have been handled differently? Can the service take responsibility of when, what went wrong rather than uh, managing public opinion? We are talking about people's lives here and we need to start taking these lives seriously. I want to be clear that my uh, comments are not meant to be a standard uh, message about all police officers, but one negative interaction that could be avoidable Avoidable is one too many. Despite all the excellent work that was noted in your report, Chief, we still know the names of Andrew Loku, Jermaine Carby, Michael Elgin, and Ian Price. We know those names because they were killed not by social workers, not by mental health workers, unfortunately by police officers, and as such, this discussion lies squarely at this table. We know for a fact that your service has the capacity to not kill a black person, and we saw that on April 25th when your officer made the conscious decision to preserve the life of a white man, Alex Manassian. So some of the questions that clearly need to be asked is, what are you going to do about racism and anti-black racism within the institution? Where is the acceptance and acknowledgement of institutional racism and anti-blackness that continues to support the individual behaviors, which may occur knowingly or unknowingly? The problem does not lie only at the, with the frontline officers, and as such, the solution does not lie there only. The service needs to be able to ask these questions without fear because unless these real conversations take place, real change will not happen and we will continue to bury ourselves in comprehensive reports which don't contribute towards change but continue to maintain the status quo. I've brought copies of Dr. Kwa McKenzie's report which provides a good starting point to have those important discussions around institutional change. I hope the board will have the courage to engage in those discussions with the chief because silence and inaction now will be a death sentence for many more in our communities. Good day. Just by way of background for members of the board who may not be fully aware of the inquest itself, eight of the 15 recommendations recommended by the coroner's jury and directed at the chief of police deal with racism and specifically anti-black racism. In our respectable submission, although there are some parts of the report we like, the report is not reflective of what became the dominant issue with that inquest, and that is anti-black racism. Rather, the report is reflective of what the chief's counsel advocated to the jury, and essentially she advocated two things. Number one, most of the recommendations we were seeking uh, were already in place, so there was no need to deal with them. And secondly, that dealing with racism at all, and specifically anti-black racism, uh, was beyond the scope of the inquest, when really the jury saw through it. That was the key to the inquest. Finally, just with respect to training, both of the officers, the subject officer who fired the gun and his partner who had his gun out and ready to fire, both testified that they had taken all of the available training. And it was put up in the screen in front of the jury. So they had all of that training, and yet between 12 and 16 seconds, 
after their arrival without any attempt to de-escalate. They shot and killed Andrew Loco, which leads me to believe either the training can't work or certainly doesn't work or officers are not listening to the training and not, uh, not keeping it in mind. Thank you for hearing us out. Uh, Sifa Howard, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, are there any questions uh, of either of the two deputants? Uh, Ken? What would be your <coughs> suggestions about uh, monitoring and evaluating the training so that the improvements that you seek would, would, would occur? One of the big criticisms we had of the training, when they put the syllabuses up, they would put up what was covered in a 75 minute period with the officers. If I was teaching at law school, it would take me more than a week to even take off the top. They would have the charter, the human rights code, the criminal code, all bundled in. So there's just too much in each session. I know the chief is concerned about the cost of focusing on anti-black racism in the training, but I think that has to be specifically designed out of the police service and perhaps conducted at a university like Ryerson. Ryerson would be the perfect place to conduct that type of training for police officers and then they would be in a position to evaluate it. I don't know if that answers, sort of. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Any other questions, colleagues? Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Howard Asifa. Uh, colleagues, any um, uh, questions for uh, the, the, the chief and uh, the service? Upla? Not a question, but more of a comment. Um, I'm not going to go through all the concerns and questions that I raised when this was first uh, presented to us. Um, what I'm going to say is, is thank you to your staff, especially uh, Deputy McLean and Inspector Body uh, for sitting down with me and going through the concerns and, and hearing that out. I really appreciate it. And I know um, our fellow board member, Marie Mulliner, had done the same. So we really appreciate that. And what I walked away with was that this is very much a living document. It's not something that uh, you're going to put aside after, after we receive the report. And I think with that in mind, uh, what I want to encourage the board is we have uh, two very capable co subcommittees that we're struck. So there's the mental health subcommittee and the upcoming anti-racism advisory panel. I think it'd be very, um, very prudent of us to forward this also to those two groups to have their input as well um, and, and to continue this conversation because this isn't a, a one-time conversation. Opla, thank you. Ken? The chief, um, you know, this whole concept on practice of anti-black racism for some people is relatively new. Um, however, um, I, do you have a sense as to how that is, how, how the rank and file respond to or react to this whole no notion of anti-black racism? I should point out that the city of Toronto, there was a conference on anti-black racism and it was hosted by the mayor uh, some time ago. And, you know, and of course you had the anti, with the former government, you know, established the, the, the anti-racism directorate. So, and they've also acknowledged anti, specifically anti-black racism. So I want to get a sense as to how, what is the reaction and response to, or to that by the rank of her? Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Er, sorry, thank you, Mr. Jeffers. Um, yeah, yeah, thank, thank, you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Me, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jeffers. Um, well, there's a whole lot to talk about. Um, listen, first off, anything that we can do to, to improve our, our abilities to be better and to have better outcomes when it comes to understanding that every interaction matters, no matter where you are, uh, representing the Toronto Police Organization is, is hugely important to us as an organization. So that is why that learning process is evergreen each and every day with all of our procedures, policies, governance, um, which is why 
when I took the chair, I added a third day specific to training so that our officers could be equipped with those tools so that we can have the most successful outcomes as possible. Um, we can theorize this to death, and, and we know that theory application isn't necessarily the best approach for what the expectations of a frontline officer are. Uh, but I, I can tell you when it comes to the training piece, not only did we provide the PACER Advisory uh, Committee uh, opportunity to look at all of our training, look at it through a racialized lens, help us improve, not just through the theory, but through the uh, practical scenarios, which is in, in many layers. First, the theory application, so that people have an understanding of why we need to do what we need to do. And then secondly, in, in the um, scenario-based scenarios, so that we can actually see how they apply the theory to make sure they have a comprehensive understanding. And then the simulator on top of that as another layer which I purchase, so that it gives us the opportunity in these simulators to replicate real-time things that have happened within our day-to-day -day environment situation so that we can have uh, opportunities to learn and develop how to improve on those scenarios, but also to teach our officers. And then using Kirkpatrick uh, measuring tools to make sure that when our officers go out, we are asking the questions operationally whether or not the training has been beneficial to our men and women out there and utilizing that to figure out how to improve upon all of those things. And when it comes to the training, having people with lived experiences coming and talking to us so that we have that emotional peace, so that we have that social justice discussion and understanding and what we need to do in order to be successful. So when it comes to understanding the theory and what needs to be understood by law, that is a necessary component. But what we're looking for in the most situations when a officer is standing in front of a person living with mental health issues is the behavior of the officer, understanding what they need to do. And a lot of it has come from learned, um, uh, learned lessons. Um, and Ms. Chambers, who was a part of the PACER Advisory Committee, and thank you for being here, talking about tactical training and not just yelling and screaming at everybody, but understanding through, the, through people with lived experiences who have taught us that, that is not necessarily the best outcome. But the interchangeability of the word de-escalation is something that I, I think maybe there needs to be stronger messaging and, and, and public education of, of when that is applied and why it is applied. Our training is validated with the fact that our use of force is less than 1%. It's 0.50% when we talk about the encounters that we have. That is a celebration. And so the reason why these names that are mentioned because these are the very, very, very small numbers of outcomes where we've had an opportunity to learn, to grow, to be better at what we do. But the vast majority of other times we are doing it successfully and each and every time we're scrutinizing how can we even be better at what we do. So make no mistake, we are listening to everything and, and putting it into context, but make no mistake, the officers are doing a fantastic job and they are hoping to improve on that each and every day as they go out there on their own. Thank you, Chief. Um, any other comments or questions? You know, I, I, I know, uh, Mark, uh, the, the, the outstanding work that the officers do and the vast vast number of these things um, are handled successfully and with very positive outcomes to uh, to people uh, you know struggling and in distress uh, as you know our target is zero you know we've achieved that for instance last year and even though we're in 2016 rather than no one's really paying it that's why in 2017 no one's really paying attention with the uh, uh, the use of uh, uh, police uh, dealing uh, with uh, uh, death, etc. But the target is still zero, and so as you say, we learn from each one of these, and and uh, uh, that's why it's important. Yes, and the foundational principle of, of the encounters that uh, we have with anyone in any circumstance is to use as least force as possible in that situation. Those are the guiding principles of every interaction right at the forefront of your thought process and every decision that is being made. And, and using that and predicating it from that particular perspective, um, that's why I believe our numbers are so low when it comes to the, the use of force that is being used across the service on a daily basis. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chief. If there's nothing else, um, uh, you've got a motion on the... Uh, is that is that you putting that forward? 
that the board approve the report and refer it to the Mental Health Subcommittee uh, and the upcoming Anti-Racism Advisory Panel for information. So you're putting that forward. Um, we have to uh, re receive the depositions and approve the uh, report, and that's the, the motion you're putting forward uh, with it. Uh, is there a seconder to that? Mr. Jeffers, or Councillor Hart, Mr. Jeffers, you second that? Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> All in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Thank you. Um, that brings us now, Caroline, to item number 13, is that right? Which is uh, outstanding board reports. There was a deposition by Chris Langenfeld. He has uh, not here. I would just say for everybody who's been with that this there is a backlog of these. Uh, our intention is to identify them. Uh, of the 51 that are there, I think there's uh, uh, almost half of them have got uh, the, the targets on them and or or have been superseded by other uh, events. But we want to get uh, fully caught up, and uh, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, given the fact that Chris Langenfeld is not here to make a deposition, there is a motion um, uh, that the board amend the suggested action on page nine of the attachment to read uh, letter response be sent to an accompanying board, uh, sorry, with an accompanying board report uh, to the July 2018 board meeting. Correct. Okay, is there a, a, a sponsor for that motion? Councillor Hart, thank you. Seconded. Mayor Tory, all in favor? Any contrary? Thank you. Uh, that takes us to item number uh, 15, yeah, uh, which uh, there is a deputation from uh, uh, Dion Rene. This Thank item you. number 15 uh, is titled, or the subject is, Public Reporting of Special Investigation uh, Unit Investigations. And uh, just as a reminder to everyone, the SIU mandate um, is to maintain confidence in Ontario's police services by assuring the public that police actions resulting in serious injury, death, or allegations of sexual assault are subjected to rigorous, independent investigations. Incidents which fall within this mandate must be reported to the SIU by the police service involved and or may be reported by the complainant or any other person. Um, I just want to acknowledge my sister who's sitting with me as community. Uh, as you all know that nothing happens independent. Anything that happens to any one of us affects all of us. And that is exactly what affects community wellness. Uh, under the background of your document, it says that whenever the Special Investigations Unit, uh, SIU, is notified of an incident involving serious injury or a death, I note that you have excluded uh, part of the mandate, and that is sexual assault. So this reporting document is not accurate, and it needs to be accurate to be, to be reflective of what the duties are, and uh, it is... Um, Refer referencing section 11.1 of regulation 267-10. Um, and that reference specifically says, the chief of police shall also cause an investigation to be conducted forthwith into any incident with respect to which the SIU has been notified, uh, subject to the SIU's lead role in investigating the incident. So for clarity, this document, which is only three pages, I have a lot of questions that I'm hoping the board has questions as well and is not just silent on just accepting something. Um, is that as soon as the SIU is notified that the chief has to now commence an investigation? I'm curious about that. And if so, is the chief also com uh, um, 
you specifically highlight administrative, although the act does not, the regulation does not identify administrative. So perhaps that might be clarified for the public as to why uh, that's indicated, whereas the regulation does not say administrative investigation, it just simply says investigation. Also, uh, what I'm curious about, there's no indicator here that identifies on the graph, at least, that was provided on page two of your document, if everybody's look, looked at that. It says nothing. I don't know why we should, we should be able to accept what's here. There, you know, in 2016, the public raised with this board, and this board uh, rightly agreed, that things need to be distinguished and clarified and identified so that we can all appreciate what's really going on. In this graph, there's no indicator about gender, there's no indicator about race, there's no indicator about age range, all of these factors contribute to being rightly informed so that we can have clarity. There was issues about race raised earlier by Howard Morton and our dear sister. These are outstanding issues that we want to know as the public. When reports are offered to you, it's not just to the board, it's to the public. The board acts on behalf of the public's interest. And so these things need to be clear. Um, further, it says that um, the purpose of the chief, and this is item two under 11.1 of the regulation, says the purpose of the chief of police's investigation is to review the policies of or services provided by the police force and, this con and the conduct of its police officers. Four of that section says the chief of police of a municipal force shall report his or her findings and any action taken or recommended to be taken to the board within 30 days after the SIU director advises the chief of police that he or she has reported reported the results of the SIU's investigation to the Attorney General, and the board may make the Chief of Police report available to the public. So having said that, I note that later on you're going to be referencing some reports. And based on my knowledge, I'm not aware if there's anything in here that identifies um, what the report was about, whether it was a death, whether, it, I mean, you can get to that in reading some information, but whether there was a death, the serious injury, or a sexual assault. And again, these things need to be clear to the public. Um, I don't know if this was wording, but I found it difficult to understand on the second page where it says professional standards support is responsible for preparing these confidential and public reports. That seems conflicting in its language. I don't know if you mean for preparing confidential and public reports. I'm not clear on that. Uh, later on in about the fourth paragraph, it says, as of May 23rd, 2018, there have been 30 new SIU cases. But I'm wondering, how did this figure of five years come? Was it just a random number? And if so, why are we including 2018 when the year is not over? Why is it not reflected of 2013 to 2017, which will give an accurate five-year uh, report? And then it says below, it kind of contradicts with the portion that says the 30 cases also represent a reduction over the two previous years. That's inaccurate uh, in, based on the documentation that's before us. So I'm questioning how we come to these conclusions and uh, how we assess whether or not the information is being provided. Just very quickly, uh, I just wanted to know um, very quickly about how the board actually ex assesses the accuracy of the information that's provided to them. Any questions, uh, Is there anything you want to clarify on that? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the report, it refers to the first quarter and uh, uh, refers to the first quarters. No, there are a multitude of things. Uh, the, the, uh, under the, um, when yeah, the mandates invoked, the, the section 11 is for an administrative investigation by me for procedure policy, conduct, training, or service. And, and we do report and we um, hit our, our timelines to the best of our ability. Um, a lot of conclusiveness of the report depends on the information that, or the evidence that we do receive from the SIU. They are not um, compelled to give us everything, and sometimes that causes some delays with uh, respect to having the opportunity of submitting the final administrative report. But uh, the board has taken it upon itself when the wording is that the board may release. Uh, uh, months ago, the board uh, took the initiative to say that they shall release, and, and we are working uh, with uh, the board. Ju June of two years ago, I think. June of 
Well, hence all yeah. of these right. uh, and this things that are catch going up. through right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, th I think we, we are doing our best to exercise uh, that transparency piece, which the public deserves to have. And, and uh, um, I, I was just trying to scrutinize and look through the um, uh, through the website because I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Section 11 piece does state the responsibility of uh, the chief of police or commissioner of police when it comes to the administrative process of investigation that is mandated by the Act. Any other questions of uh, the colleagues, uh, comments? Okay. John, thank you very much. Um, uh, if there's no further questions of the chief, then a motion to... But uh, sir, the, the portion of the sexual assaults is missing in your documentation and purpose, and uh, that is not accurate as to the Dion. act in itself. Thank you, Dion. And I'm surprised no one has raised that. Uh, colleagues, uh, motion to receive. Um, and it is again item number 15. Motion to receive. Mayor Tory, seconded to Councillor Hart. All in favor? Any contrary? Thank you. Um, that brings us to item number uh, 16, I thought we had. Sorry, 17. 16, yeah. Um, which is the. Uh, uh, sexual harassment provisions of the occupational health and safety policy, and there's two deputations. One is the first one is Brenda Ross. Brenda, do you need some help? Okay. I don't sit down. It's a wheelie chair. I can't sit in a chair with wheels. I'll fall on the floor. Um, no, I'm okay. Thank yeah. you so much for helping. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. You've uh, welcome again, and you've got five minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute warning. All right. So basically, the topic is sexual harassment, and our chief of police has said he's reviewed the policy. He finds nothing wrong. It's an expectation of what we think should be um, correct and helpful to the employees of the police force. If this was true and there was nothing wrong, then we wouldn't open up our newspapers to see everyone complaining and saying they've been sexually harassed. And we wouldn't have had Shelley Carroll sitting over there on the board telling us that numerous people have called her office complaining, employees of the police force, they are sexually harassed. I maintain that this has not been done properly. So the chief of police has looked at the policy. I'm sure there's a written policy, and he's looked at it. This does not tell us that it's being carried out properly and that there are no problems. It just tells us that in writing, the policy seems to be best practice. I understand that. But it's not about what's in writing. It's about what is happening. And I've said this numerous times on other topics. I don't care what we have in writing, it's what is happening. And what's happening is that police women are complaining, are calling counselors and going to the newspaper, calling the Human Rights Commission and appearing there and saying they've been harassed. Harassment is abuse. It's a form of abuse. One minute, please. People who have never been harassed don't understand how horrible it is. I want the chief of police to take this more seriously. It's not good enough to be the chief and say, our policy is OK. Of course it's OK. If it wasn't OK, people would have said they wanted it changed. It is not being carried out. I want you to speak to complainants and ask them what's wrong. What's wrong? How about a survey of the police women? How about somebody ask them, are they okay? 
an anonymous survey. What's wrong with you? Do you have something you want to say? Don't sign your name. Just hand it in. Please, Chief Saunders. Thank you, Brenda. Thank any, you. any questions uh, for Brenda? OK, thank you very much. Um, there is one more uh, deputy here, and it's uh, Dion Rene. Dion, do you mind if I stay here? I'll give it to you. I can't sit in it. May I stand with you? Is that OK? Absolutely. Thank Here's you. a little more water in case you run out. Thank you. I do. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. God well, bless. I do need those papers. Oh, you need those papers. Sorry, I forgot. Thank know, you. I Thank you so sorry much. Sorry about that. It's Brenda, right? Oh, thank oh, you. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Okay, Dion. You know the rules. Five minutes. Uh, so I am surprised that at least the the women on this board said nothing about the last report as it pertains to um, the police chief and the role of um, reporting uh, SIU investigations, which do include sexual assaults. And I'm still wondering why this board hasn't asked why that's not included in the background and purpose in particular towards the women of this board that uh, you would appreciate uh, that men who primarily make up who are sitting at this table overlook or oversee or ignore issues that affect women in particular sexual assaults. So it is troubling to me uh, that voices are not being heard, that voices are not being spoken up, and it's not being evident and public uh, to members of the public where these positions stand. And that would also go for uh, towards members of the service who are women who know that these things take place, it's not captured in this information, and it's incumbent on you to raise these things. The question is, I'm wondering if you're raising these things and you're overruled uh, by some other subjective positions that doesn't allow you to be heard. And that leads us to these issues of complaints with regards to sexual assaults and harassment by members of the service, and whether or not there is an accountability measure as to whether or not claims or, act, uh, or complaints are taken seriously, are, are identified by the force, and changed with regards to the environment, the work environment, uh, the culture in which officers are forced to be in, and the harassment and bullying that does take place. We wouldn't have such a policy if these things were not affecting members of the force. They affect men as well. There are, are uh, terms and words used to harass and slander individuals that is not captured in here, language that's being used uh, both against both genders and even to uh, try to pacify situations. Um, so for me, when I read this report, uh, there's a lot of information absent, again, as a member of the public, wanting to be informed how our members of the service are being protected under these policies. On page two, there is an indicator for routine order 2016.08.29-0955. When I tried to find it, I couldn't. And I'm wondering why when you make references such as these, we've raised these issues in the past. I know we've raised it in 2015 because I raised it directly. Why when you're making a recommendation or identifying a reference that you're not going to include it in the documentation so that anyone attending here or anyone reviewing online can follow and understand and appreciate what you're actually identifying. So to this date, I still don't know what that reference is. I, don't, I can't even ask questions about it because I'm not informed. And so if you're showing me something, I'm wondering whether the members of the service are being rightly informed as well. Sexual assault is uh, one where individuals who are assaulted are usually traumatized. And in, and in being traumatized, and especially if you're a member of the service and you're having to conduct your duties and, and fulfill your obligations, um, pay your bills, take care of your family, it's this attitude sometimes, a culture of thinking, suck it up, it's just a joke. And if somebody doesn't take it as a joke, and, and rightly shouldn't, how does this board 
assessed whether or not these things are dealt with or are you also dismissive in agreeing that it was just a joke or it was just uh, you know, um, it was an accident or being dismissive of what was actually said. My concern based on um, how you've ignored that sexual assault is part of the SIAU's mandate in that reporting leads me to be troubled about how this board is assessing members of the service who actually make uh, complaints about harassment and sexual assault. So I'm again asking the board the same questions I've asked before. Where's the accountability? How are you assessing the accuracy? How are you assessing whether or not people are getting the help that they need and whether or not these things, policy changes or cultural changes are being effective or effected? Dion, thank you. Uh, colleagues, questions? Uh, it's just as a point, so good one. We refer to routine order on that number. Is there a way that someone can access it? Just uh, let me check. Can you uh, refer me to what page? It's uh, on our. It's page two of the report, and it's halfway down, where it starts uh, the, the paragraph in order to ensure compliance. And halfway, you've got routine order uh, 2016, uh, 0829 uh, 0955. Yeah, those are, that's an internal mechanism of uh, messaging that, that we utilize to the uh, all staff members, the Swan and Civilian, right across the, uh, the board. Um, yeah. But there's nothing confidential about it, presumably. Um, you know what, there are some things that, I, that are, that, okay. that will give up, um, I, I don't want to give up portions of the playbook of what we do and when we do what we do, and I can certainly have a look to see if, if things like this in the future can be reframed. I, I'm not necessarily yeah, sure. I mean, I, but what, what the point that we're trying to make is that we communicate to every member yes. of the service. It's a mechanism that we use to do that, and that's what we are communicating. Um, in the future, we can just exclude that and say we communicate to all members of the service and this is what we do to avoid any type of confusion which may take place. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's better because I agree with uh, Ms. Rene that when you refer to something, uh, it, you know, what is it? It, it brings the question that we, you know, we, we should be able to see it unless it's something that uh, pertains to uh, the confidentiality of the service. No, I can see the confusion. Okay. We were just trying to make sure that the board knew and we were held accountable that we had a reference point to say, we are communicating to people and it's not lip service, but we can validate it by going to here if we need to validate that too. But I can see the confusion from the public um, lens and we'll definitely improve on that. And when is something like this, if you review it, and it is something that isn't uh, you know, uh, an insight into uh, uh, something that uh, would be inappropriate, we should make it available. It would, chances are to avoid confusion in the future, I, I won't use it. I'll just basically say we've communicated to you and then just to stop it from there rather than starting to pull more segments of what we're trying to get across to an internal audience only. Um, colleagues, any other questions? John, thank you very much. So is there a way for us to hear today what that reference is? Isn't that what you just said? This is a... a um, order that was put out in 2016. It would take some time right. to find it. We'd have to manually go through it. But what, what he's it. saying is it's, it, there is an order that complies with what we're asking. You want the substance of it. Uh, he says he doesn't have it right now, but it is, you know, his answer will be in future, yes, we do this, uh, et cetera. So, uh, but I take your point that where we make a reference to something, it should be available for people to see. Otherwise, what's the point? suspend this reporting until that's clear to everybody because rightly we don't have the ability to ask about something we cannot see and it wouldn't be fair for this board to approve something without the clarity that everybody has access to raise issues on. It, it, um, uh, Barb, do you want to weigh in?
So the chief is absolutely right. This is an internal uh, means by which we communicate to our members. So the change that came in the Occupational Health and Safety Act was that it added to workplace harassment the idea of sexual harassment, now part of workplace harassment. We communicated that change, that the definition of workplace harassment had expanded to include sexual harassment as well. And that's the substance of the communication. Uh, and that's the substance of this communication, which is recorded by a number in 2016. Okay. Just that it's so, expanded? That's okay. Yeah. Uh, Dion, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, any other questions uh, of the chief? Excuse me, Chairman Kringle. We haven't ruled on whether or not we are going to revisit the question and find out, although the policy sounds good, is it actually being carried out? Uh, I'm just asking my colleagues now. We've had your input, which, for which we thank you. We're now going to uh, d discuss the issue. I've just asked our colleagues if there are any questions they have for clarification of the service. If not, we're going to uh, vote on uh, uh, the acceptance of, uh, of uh, sorry, is it to receive or to accept? It's to receive, it's to receive uh, item number 16, which is the, uh, sorry, receive the deputations and receive the sexual harassment provisions of the Occupational Health and Safety Policy. If there are no further questions, I may have a motion to receive the two. Councillor Hart. Uh, uh, Upa, uh, Santa Casar. All in favor? Any contrary? Carry, thank you. Um, uh, the, that brings us to item number 17, which is the annual report 2017, the training program. And again, their deputations and Brenda, you're already positioned, so thank you. And uh, you know the rules, five minutes, and I'll give you the one minute warning. All right, so basically we're talking about the police college and the training. <clears throat> Excuse me. I refer you to page 28, second bullet, diversity and inclusivity. And the police college, of course, is talking about the police. They're not talking about the public. And I'm saying that this course does not go further enough, does not go far enough. They're talking about the police, but what about the public? What about the rest of the world? We'd like to be included. I'd like to be included. I don't like the way I've been treated. I don't like the way my family's been treated. In particular, we'll talk more about this next month. But in the meanwhile, I'd like to bring to your attention that I have today received this letter, was handed to me by one of the members of the staff of the board, talking to me about an enabler. I have asked for an enabler to deal with the police service and the police board due to my failing health. Nobody knew the answer to any of my questions. Nobody knew what an enabler was. We have a law. <coughs> Excuse me. I do ask for your indulgence for a moment, please. We have a law. And the law is called the Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And I want you to invoke that you understand this act, what it means, and that you're required to help me unless it is undue hardship upon the police service. This is not undue hardship for the police service to assist me in getting from my chair over to this table. It's not undue hardship to assist me in giving me the agenda in writing which Ms. Bennett always does. That is not an undue hardship. It is not an undue hardship now that I can't write. I hope that it's temporary, but I don't know that it is. And I brought a medical certificate, although it's so embarrassing every time I open my mouth to have to bring a mental health certificate and a certificate of disability like I was some kind of a, I don't even know what to say, a freak. Everybody that's crippled or handicapped is not a freak. There are no freaks in this world. Now, I need an enabler. I can't use my hand. 
I can't use my hands. They're not going to write anymore, we don't think. Maybe they'll get better, maybe they won't. I hope they do. I'm looking for a contraption that would help me write, and we don't seem to have them in Canada, which is unbelievable. The bottom line is, I need someone that will take dictation from me and communications to the board and the police service. I'm calling on my chief of police to back me up on this. Uh, uh, sorry, just you only have thank you. Minutes. Go Stop. ahead. Tell me at the end. Uh, so, bottom line of the story is, our family have been made fools out of by three policemen writing reports that sound like a script for the Twilight Zone. My family's not actors in a movie. We're real people. We're a real family. And I want to respond. Now, bottom line. I need an immediate enabler to help me respond to the board, the reports, and the police service. And I want the backing of the chief. In right. addition, I've asked to speak to Jim Hart, a new member of the board, who's not aware of my complaints. I've asked to speak to the mayor, who've all refused to see me. I've asked to speak to you, who's refused to see me. But my time is running out. I'm very sick, and I want these matters resolved while I'm still breathing. <coughs> Excuse me. Brenda, thank you. Uh, Could I please much. have a response? Can uh, I have an immediate uh, enabler? Um, Car Carlene, do you want to just elaborate on that, please? But that is not what I need. I need an enabler right now to respond to what I want to respond to. Um, so we have committed to assisting you next month with respect to your complaint that review that's being heard at next month's board meeting. I have um, reached out to the chief's office and they are looking into getting you an enabler or assisting you with respect to the other general um, issues that you've talked about, the other complaints. So a response is coming on that. But in the interim, we have committed to assisting you next month to respond to that report that will deal with your complaint review. And that it says that in the letter. I understand that perfectly, Ms. Bennett, but I'm talking about two other reports. I wish to respond to them. Chief Saunders, I'm asking you for a quick response to my request, which is covered under Ontarians with Disability Act. Brenda, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next deputy, Derek. Thank you, my dear. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Please tell me what you know. Maybe a lady like this uh, deserves more time than you give to all of us. Uh, I've got to be, be fair to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank an you. Act of compassion, amend your whatever you need to amend, so that people. Thank you very much. Don't have to suffer. They won't. Thank you very much, Derek. So I'm here to speak about the free man on the land item mentioned in this report. But before I do, um, Chris had to leave early. He just simply asked if I could pass along uh, his main message, was, which since this is a training uh, report, if um, that in the future the police could be uh, given improved uh, training, I guess, upon basically revolving around Section 8 of the Constitution. So Meads versus Meads is what's considered to be like the case law in regards to these whole free men on the land. It's not case, uh, but it's actually, it's a case, but it's not case law, it's obiter dictum. The reason why is, is because ironically, this is a case that was about a divorce case in family court with a guy who chose to get the state involved with his life when he got a marriage license. And Justice Rook in this case says, some individuals or groups have no name or special identity. They, by their own admission or by descriptions given by others, often fall into the following descriptions. D-taxers, free men, free men on the land, sovereign men, sovereign citizens, Church of the Ecumenical Redemption International, Moorish Law, and other labels. There is no closed list, 
In the absence of a better moniker, I have collectively labeled them as organized pseudo-legal commercial argument litigants, OPCA litigants. To functionally define them collectively for what they literally are, these persons employ a collection of techniques and arguments promoted and sold by gurus, as hereafter defined, to disrupt court operations and to attempt to frustrate the legal rights of governments, corporations, and individuals. Now, you know who Crown Attorneys Jeffrey Clayton and Aliyah Ahmed think is an opka? I, I don't accept that label, by the way. So this is from an affidavit I have sitting in 393 University. I'm going to read it, and then the police can decide whether to make this a part of their training on how to deal with an opka. So last November, I went to Metro Hall for the public consultation being held regarding the police oversight review headed up by Justice Michael Tullock. I got a chance to speak with Justice Tullock as he was mingling through the crowd. I said to him, Justice Tullock, what if I told you I executed the trust with Her Majesty? He asked me what I meant. I said to him, I don't know if you've ever seen Section 59 of the Federal Financial Administration Act, but it says Her Majesty is not bound to execute the trust. He then grins, smiles slightly, and lightly nods his head to me a few times. I then mentioned to him that the signatures of the Registrar Generals at the bottom of the birth certificate we all get grant us the power to execute the trust, and that all we have to do is convey, transfer the birth certificate back to the Registrar Generals, which executes the trust with Her Majesty by operation of law. I said I just wanted to tell him all this to see what he would say and ask him if he knew at all what I was talking about. Now grinning, he said to me that, um, yes, I think I know what you're talking about. He now clasps my elbow lightly and leaning closer towards me, he says, but I'm a judge and what I will say is that I can't really talk about these things. He then starts to back away as I say to him, I know Donovan Waters in his Law of Trust in Canada text says that the Court of Equity has sole jurisdiction over trusts, and I just wanted to say hi to you in case I ever go for a declaratory judgment regarding this, and it's you I end up seeing in the Court of Equity. Justice Tullock stops, again smiles, and says to me before he walks away, well, what I would say is that I do hope I get to see you again one day in the Court of Equity. He's such a nice guy, wasn't he? So at paragraph 230, of Meads, Justice Rook also says a person's birth certificate is a focus of certain OPCA schemes. Take notice, Ontario Superior Court in 2013 said in Canadian banknote versus LeBlanc, background facts, paragraph two, the plaintiff, Canadian banknote, is a developer and manufacturer of security printing services and security systems. Because if you all go home and take a close look at the birth certificate you get, it says on, on the very bottom of mine, well, the Register General's has mine now. It, uh, it says in very teeny weeny letters, Canadian Banknote Company Limited. Wait a sec, what business are they in again? They're in the business of security printing services. It seems the birth certificate is a security. Who'd have thunk that, huh? I know. So don't forget it. It was only until recently the province of Ontario started printing this certificate as a valuable foundation identity document on the back of their birth certificates, as before that they had been concealing that information. So it's really easy to criticize someone for bringing up the birth certificate, especially knowing the province of British Columbia gives full disclosure, proper notice on the back of theirs by printing revenue receipt, a CUSIP number. You know what a CUSIP number is, Chair Pringle. It's the number that starts with a letter, evidence is a security for treasury use only on it. Criticizing me wouldn't be as easy to do if the province of Ontario wasn't concealing that information on the back of their birth certificates. And I've asked Premier Wynne by email a number of times that same question. And for some reason, she wouldn't answer me. She was going out to all these town halls saying, oh, no, hold, no, and no, all questions taken, no holds barred. But she won't answer my question. I wonder why. So uh, is, that, is that my five minutes? You actually, you shorted me 14 seconds last month, so uh, I'll make it up that way. About the report, anything you want to ask staff? If not, may we have a motion to uh, receive 
the deputations and the report. Councillor Hart, uh, Mr. Jeffers, all in favor, any contrary, thank you. Uh, and then there is one more item, I think, and that is item number 30, which, uh, Derek, again, you want to comment on the correspondence around the OAPSB regarding Bill 175, the Safer Ontario Act. I was speaking to Mayor Tory at Executive Committee on Tuesday about the current one, and I was just talking off the top of my head, but I found where, uh, where I was citing this from. This is from the recent uh, Langenfeld case. Uh, Justice Jill Copeland says, in both of these decisions, the Court of Appeal held that the authority to search members of the public prior to entry into courthouses is, existed as a result of the Public Works Protection Act, then in force, and Section 137 of the Police Services Act, now all continued in Sections 137 and 142 of the Police Services Act. Thus, in the context of premier peri uh, perimeter security for courthouses, the legislature has seen fit to provide express legislative authority to allow for searches prior to entry. And it's going to be uh, sections 190 to 194 in the Safer Ontario Act. So in this letter, Solicitor General Marie France Lalon writes, the Police Services Act 2018 will modernize our approach to community safety by mandating municipalities to undertake local community safety and well-being planning, improve police oversight, transparency and accountability, enhance civilian governance in response to the needs and realities of Ontario's diverse communities, transparency and accountability. Now, uh, Justice Copeland also touched on that briefly in the Langenfeld case. I note that I find that attendance at police, public police services board meetings is an activity protected by section 2B of the charter, whether or not the person attending intends to speak at the public meeting. That is the right to attend and be informed of the activities of a government body at a public meeting has expressive content. Justice Copeland also said, further, I accept the applicant's argument that making a submission remotely is not as effective as attending a meeting in person to make a submission because if a submission is made remotely, he would lose the ability to ask follow-up questions. That's the part that kind of loses me because uh, I didn't know that we had the ability to ask questions there, but I, I guess we do now. Are you shaking your head when I say that? But Derek, you're really not sticking to the letter, and I, it's the, kind of the end of the day, and I'm a little, but please, you've got two minutes. Okay, um, I'm not sticking to the letter. Do, do you actually know what Section 2B of the Constitution says? Derek. No, it, co it covers, stick, it covers freedom of expression. Okay. That part in the charter means, like I've heard so many times before, like we don't have to like stick to the exact issue in the item. Like I wouldn't come down here to talk about something else, but that's part of the control I was talking about. You know, you guys are too focused on controlling, talk exactly on the issue, the specific topic. And you guys should focus more on upholding the oath that you took to uphold the constitution. Oh, man. So, you, you, mentioned, you know, before I mentioned that I got a, a bunch of case law about this. Aventus Pasteur Limited versus Canada Attorney General, 2004 Federal Court. The public's right to know how government spends public funds as a meeting of holding government accountable for its expenditures is a fundamental notion of responsible government that is known to all. Central Auto Parts versus Barclay, 2006 Ontario Court of Appeal as in Webb versus Waterloo Regional Services Police Board, standard police media policies and practices and the public's right to know have to be considered. N. Dean versus British Columbia, 2016 Supreme Court of Canada, it must be understood as an ensemble of practices and principles that are called upon in various contexts to serve our society's democratic ideals one of which being the public's right to know the law and to understand its application. R versus Mabier, 2012, Supreme Court of Canada. However, over time, equity recognized specific circumstances warranting a positive duty to disclose material facts, including a relationship of trust, quasi-trust, or confidence. Doe et al. versus Canadian Surety Company, 1937, Supreme Court of Canada. Canada misrepresentation may, of course, be made by mere silence or concealment. And 
Um, I mean, I, I don't understand why you why you interrupt me while I was talking. How, how this does not everything I said has to do with the Police Services Act and the new Safer Ontario Act. So, did you give me a little bit extra time to make up for your interrupting me, uh, Derek? I always do. You always do. Yeah. Do I have any time it's left? It's a regular thing. Do, do we have any but, money in the budget, Meritori, to give these guys a clock? So Derek, can, like, thank you very much. I um, appreciate uh, your comments and attendance, colleagues. Any questions? <laughs> For Derek, Derek, thank you. You like? I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. I hope you're taking your business to Miguel. <laughs> um, uh, colleagues, uh, we need a uh, motion to uh, receive the deputation and receive the uh, uh, the minister's uh, letter. Uh, Upla, seconded by Ken. All in favor? Any contrary? Colleagues, is there any other business that one wishes to bring up? If not, uh, thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned.